Safi, ähm, der Zoom-Livestream in der Meeting lädt jetzt. Ja, sind wir online. Ich schicke einen Link. Dann den Redirecting und YouTube macht jetzt äh, im Moment auf und Livestream ist okay. offline. Wir sind online, sagt der Safi. Okay, gut, weil hier bekomme ich ein Prom, ob ich sein into YouTube sollte. Ich klicke einfach nur Thanks, ja? Yeah? Okay. Okay, super. Ja, ist sein Screen nicht, aber ich würde sagen, ja. Wir darf genau, wir sind online. Also ich, ich mache mal ein Bild und schickt euch, ähm, was ich sehe auf meiner Seite. Nicht schlimm. Du musst entweder lauter, also Safi meint es okay. Okay, perfekt. Ich gucke gerade in Dortmund. Du bist leise, oder? Nee. Online. Ähm. Safi, du bekommst ein WhatsApp von mir mit deinem Bild. Schau mal, ob das alles richtig ist, bitte. Katrin braucht noch den Link äh, per E-Mail, ja? Mhm. Yes, waiting for the link. Perfect. Danke. Um, should we start letting more people in since we're about to start or what do you guys think? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, then I will open the room. I also be here. You can hear me? Yes, uh -huh. Paul. Perfect. Hi, Paul. Paul, kannst du deine Kamera noch ein kleines Stück mehr kippen, dass du mehr in der Mitte vom Bildschirm bist? Du hast oben jetzt so viel Luft. Dann sieht man dich besser. Ja, ich sehe mich selber gerade nicht. Ah, jetzt. Bisschen. Perfekt. Okay. Ich finde es gut. Also, eine Frage, bevor ich den äh, Rekorden starten. Jeder, der einen Co-Host braucht, hat alle Co-Hosts recht, ne? Weil dann würde ich den äh, Screen klein machen von der äh, Gallery. Habt ihr alle Co-Hosts, die, die alle, die braucht? Ja. ja. Perfekt, okay. Dann starte ich jetzt. Now, can we start? Yes. Okay, everyone. So a warm welcome from Frankfurt to all Congress participants. Um, I would like to quickly introduce ourselves before we start. My name is Nina and uh, this is Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine. And we and our team will help you today with the technical moderation of this event. We are very excited that we have almost 300 participants from all over the world. This is very exciting and it's very good to see all of you. 
Um, before we get started with the actual official program, we would also like to go over some organizational points with you. Please make sure that your display name is your actual name. Um, in case Zoom selected your name of your cell phone or your computer, make sure that you re rename to your actual name and you can do this with the right click of your mouse. During the lectures, all microphones and cameras will be turned off to make sure that we have a stable internet connection. And then after each lecture, we will have a Q&A session. If you have a question for a lecturer, please write your name into um, the chat and you can do so either during or right after the lecture. Um, and please make sure you write your full name into the chat um, public so all participants can see it. Then during the Q&A session, the MY team will go through the chat and will call the names in chronological order. Then when it's your turn to ask your question, we will turn on your microphone and your camera so you can ask your question. Now, as you know that we are such a large audience today, um, we just want to already point out now that we might not be able to get through all of the questions that you have. So please bear with us that we can just go through a limited number of questions after each lecture. So we hope that all of you have a wonderful time during our Congress today. Um, if you should have any other questions besides to the lecturers, feel free to send one of the MOI team members a message in the chat. And without further ado, we now introduce to you Dr. Paul Weigel, the head of the Department of Postgraduate Education and the founder of the Master in Oral Implantology program at Goethe University. So Paul, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Nina, for this uh, nice introduction. And yeah, dear MOI family, dear valued guests, we welcome to the eighth MOI Congress. And we are very happy to have you here and the students, the alumni, and even a large number of dentists who are not yet a part of our MOI family. And we know it's not a matter, of course, for us that you take time off your job this Friday to attend this event. For those of you who are attending to our Congress and our MOI family the first time, um, I would like to give you a very brief overview of this called MOI program, which means Master of All Implantology program of the Goethe University. So shortly, our program lasts two years and aims to enable graduates to deal with and above all innovations and new uh, therapy concepts independently and fully autonomously, meaning without any help of a third person or organization. And how does this MOI program can realize this? Well, it introduced participants to the latest innovations and state-of-the-art therapy during the program in oral implantology and evaluate these innovations and therapy concepts on scientific articles. However, you know, and you can imagine how difficult it is for a clinician works very nice on the patients with a lot of skills and experience in surgery and prosto to understand and reading a scientific article with all the statistics and the methodology of scientific work. And now, how can we do this for the students? And I think it's the best way that the students make a master thesis where they have to do a scientific paper by their own. This is the best way to, yeah, to educate them to read a scientific paper later and not only to read, to evaluate it. If it's a poor paper, it's an excellent paper. Can I rely on the content or can I not rely on the content? And of course, this you can only do if you have not a third party in the program paying money and sponsoring because then you are biased and you cannot talk about free and independently about the science and the issues. And therefore we have no third party in it and we are very proud on that. 
And of course, why we have so many clinicians in our program? Yeah, because we customize the program for clinicians who are not able to close their office two years. Therefore, we change between a so-called distance learning part where you do at home the work, the patient treatment, the documentation of your cases, the master thesis, and we have a one-to-one -one ratio to educate you. And then you have to come twice a year to Frankfurt for 10 days. And here we are more related to hands-on courses, Kadava courses, and of course, also lectures. This is in a short way, the program. But if you go deeper, we invite you to visit our website. Now back to this online Congress. Our online Congress, uh, our Congress is normally, um, yeah, a uh, very, very important point for us. Every year, normally we met in Frankfurt to exchange the latest scientific research results and discuss new developments in the field of oral implantology. And it's also in this way because a meeting, a social event that we meet as again, uh, the new students and the alumni. And this makes it very special for us. However, you know, this year, the Congress cannot take place in this way because everybody far away from here is grounded due to regulations because of the pandemic. So the traveling is more or less not possible. And if then you have to go mostly in quarantine. So most of the organization cancel this kind of Congresses. We do not. Why? Because it's very important for us to stay in touch for we, we, with you and uh, therefore, it's not an option to cancel and we transfer the format in a so-called online Congress. And this is the first time for us. And I'm very proud for my staff that we do it for the first time. And we have no support from a third uh, party or a company to do this. But due to this new technologies with these platforms like Zoom, I think even we can handle these 300 participants on this online Congress all over the world. Yeah, we prepare again, very fantastic presentations for you. And I'm especially proud that most of our speakers are actually graduates of this MOI program. They will present their master thesis I talked before of the current research. And of course, having taught them all in the classroom, I feel very honored that they will return to this stage to present lectures to the next generation. Yeah, so we come first to the speaker number one. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes, it's Dr. David Doling, and he's coming from Australia. And he's graduated from the University College Cork in 2006. And he starts taking implants and placing implants exactly 12 years ago. And he completed the Master of All Implantology of the Goethe University last year in September. And this he is uh, working very nicely on his patients and now with this graduation. And he presents uh, his thesis and you can read the title by your own. It's an in vitro comparison of the accuracy of implant surgical guides produced by desktop printers versus commercial produced guides. So dear David, I hope that everything works on the technical side. We look very forward for your presentation and I'm sure uh, you have pre uh, um, prepared everything perfectly. Just in case we will run into the overtime, um, I will give you a sign. So please try to keep the 20 minutes we give you. Otherwise, um, yeah, this online Congress will ne uh, never end. Yeah, and the same is no of problem. course with the other lectures too. Okay, we look forward. Uh, yeah, David, please try to start. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Can you see my screen there now? Yes, yes. we can. Works perfectly. Uh, thanks. Thanks. It's Do nice to be. Um... Right. Do great, okay. my stuffs here. Thank you. <laughs> good. Uh, good morning, ladies and gents. It's nice to be back talking to my uh, MOI family. It's a pity that we can't all be together. Um, to, to discuss and to share all this information, but that's the way the world is um, at the moment. You might have to excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold, so my throat hasn't been the best. 
So hopefully it will hold out for the rest of the day, okay? Um, I'd like to present my thesis today. It was basically, <clears throat> basically an in vitro comparison of the accuracy of implant surgical guides produced by desktop printers versus commercially produced guides. Just as a bit of a, a background story, like Paul said, I started placing implants about 12 years ago with moderate numbers. I had a foray into guided surgery with a noble clinician. I learned in the Branamark Center here in Perth. And then with the MIS guided system and both were terrible. Um, then as I started placing more implants, I, I needed a, a more reproducible um, system that I could find would give me good results consistently. So at that point, I traveled to the um, to LA to do my first guided course through Blue Sky Bio, and um, where some of the kind of I'm going to call them like pioneers of guided surgery, in-house guided surgery, and um, were giving um, a good course there. So that was my my start. So without further ado, I'll just uh, produce go to the next slide. So. As an introduction, guided implant surgery. It's been studied so much. It's uh, proven to allow accurate placement of implants um, in a number of situations. But to date, the traditional workflows are for fabricating those guides can be extremely time consuming and convoluted. Um, it used to involve plaster models, sending them off to the lab, getting those, uh, getting diagnostic DICOM data and um, a team viewer session to bring that all together. So bringing it all in house is a much, um, much more expedient way of doing these things. There are many potential benefits of, the, of guided surgery, functionally, aesthetically, from a morbidity uh, perspective for patients. It also allows us to potentially prefabricate a prosthesis. From a collaborative uh, point of view with the treating surgeon, restorative dentist, technician, it allows the transfer of information and a much better means. As you can see from my little slide here on the, the right-hand side, the lower jaw is a guided surgery completed in less than two hours. The upper surgery is a freehand surgery completed by one of my um, esteemed colleagues. There's been a massive development in the technology in terms of um, 3D printing, you know, just, just recently, I read an article dated 2013 where they purported the, the benefits of 3D printed guides, but said that the cost of the, the machines was prohibitive. Now, these days, we can get a machine like the frozen machine in the slide for, depending on your currency, you know, two to four hundred dollars. The resins themselves per guide, five to ten dollars. So, what used to be an extremely expensive um, treatment modality, which we used to obviously have to pass on to a patient, can now be conceivably achieved for less than $40. And obviously then we can transfer this, this better patient outcome to more patients if it's readily achievable. So the aim of my thesis was to establish that the, the accuracy of placement of implants designed with free software and, and free protocols and produced uh, locally or within your, with your own office can be comparable with those produced, mass produced in, in larger offices and by the paid softwares. The hypothesis was that there'd be no statistically different di difference between the two production methods for the following variables. And these variables are the common methods of assessing the accuracy of uh, guided surgery across the board. So we have global coronal deviation. That's basically a, a measure at the entry point in both the cumulative of the horizontal and vertical. We have vertical deviation, i.e. your depth deviation, obviously important when we're coming talking about damaging the inferior alveolar, alveolar nerve or the sinus when you're in the maxilla horizontal deviation when we're in buccolingual dimensions and angular deviation. Angular deviation has the added importance and it's something that a lot of people don't understand in that for people who place relatively long implants, that factor is magnified as we travel further down um, the length of the implant. And if you consider that we've got the distance from the head of the implant 
to the guide tube and from the guide tube to the entry point of the guide, we actually have quite a long distance there when you add in a large implant. So there's a significant factor, even a small degree can throw us very, very far off. Materials and methods. In my particular case, what I used were 20 different patients who presented to my, my private clinic for treatment. Um, all of the patients that I selected for that were included in this um, study were for tooth borne guides. The reason being is generally we select our guides into three different tissues of support, tooth borne, mucosa borne, or bone borne. It's been shown by many studies that tooth borne is the most predictable. So hence I was able to control that variable. Um, for each implant that we were intending to place, externally it was treatment planned in three shape implant studio. There was a merged STL created of both the patient scan and the, the implants in place. And then that was exported to the two softwares being tested. The control group being the, um, the Blue Sky Bio software and the, in, or sorry, the test group being the Blue Sky Bio software and the photon printer. And the control group being SMOP um, treatment planning system and the printer in that case was a Stratasys. So within those softwares, the implants were then virtually placed and surgical guide. So basically the implant overlaid the STL that we exported from 3Shape and then the guides were designed and fabricated. The models, the, the surgery was performed in vitro using the MIS keyless uh, guided surgical kit, as you can see in the top left and the examples of the guides used. Bottom left was the Blue Sky Bio Guide, and the right-hand side was the MIS kit. So once those surgeries were performed, um, 40 in total, the three shape scan bodies were attached to the, the, the implant analogs, which had to be custom fabricated for the, for the study. And they were scanned in a D2000 lab scanner. And then these, um, the SDLs created from both were measured in a non-commercially available um, implant position comparer available from, from the tree shape. It, you actually can't get it commercially, unfortunately. I've had a few inquiries since, but it saved my life in terms of um, comparing these data. And basically that exported the vertical, horizontal, global coronal deviation and also the angular deviation. So there's a lot of numbers here, but basically all we have to look at is the highlighted boxes, our global coronal deviation, less than 0.9 for photon, 0.71 for the SMOP, and the horizontal deviation in the region of 0.4 for both, the vertical deviation, as I said, a very important factor, 0 0.03 for the photon, and minus 0.3, which means it wasn't fully sunk to depth. And then in terms of angular deviation, pretty much exactly the same for both. So we have a few um, basically just box plots here, but you can see there was a number of outliers in both the global coronal deviation and depth deviation, but not so much in the angular deviation. All of that was put through your standard statistical analysis. Again, lots of numbers here, but basically all we need is the, the highlighted sentence at the bottom, which said that no statistically significant difference between the test groups existed. So for me, this meant that I could now say, right, well, this workflow is validated and that we can now say, right, reliably, we can do this in-house. These benefits and cost benefits and better treat treatment outcomes can be passed on to our patients. And that's the reason why I selected this as a, a thesis subject. So I'm just gonna give a very, very simple case report. I don't wanna to get too complex or bogged down in it. This is a guided implant placement with immediate temporization. So the patient compla presented complaining of an unusual feeling from the central incisor, which had debonded and been re-cemented by another practitioner. And we can see that area of erythema surrounding the 2-1 central incisor. Radiographic evaluation showed there was a potential fracture in the buccal wall and associated breakdown of the overlying bone. So generally, you know, we're all about the prostate uh, prosthetically driven treatment planning at the moment. And just this very, very short little video shows how we can overlie the various STLs 
and the implant position. And it also shows the potential fracture and area of overlying bone body breakdown. So within that little slide, basically we've got the DICOM data, the STL data overlying it, and our guide, which shows us our prosthetically driven access. The guide design, this is the software that I, I use. And again, just a very, very simple case where we merge the DICOM data and the STLs and generate from the intraoral scanning. So here we can see our DICOM data, STLs of the lower and upper jaw, the STL guide, and our prosthetic, um, prosthetic access. Just a small bit left in that video. So the guide preparation, this is just um, a, an image of it, the, the guide produced on, again, a very, very cheap two, $300 printer. Prints in about two, two and a half hours. This is it once it's cured and within the design software. So a very, very simple workflow that can give us a good result and prevent some of those um, negative implications of freehand surgery, such as poor 3D, 3D positioning of our implant, which can lead to so many problems down the line. So just the, the treatment flow upon removal of the existing restoration from multiple fracture lines. You can see here, perfect fit of the guide. You may look at this and say, there's a misfit here, but that's actually from the virtual extraction of the tooth within the software. You can see the intimate fit of the, 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 the drill with the, the guide. You may notice also that there's no guide sleeve in this. After a period of using the guided system, I found that the tolerance between the, the drills and the actual sleeves themselves uh, was a, another potential source of error. So in refining my printing practices, I brought the, the tolerance between the components down and it gave a much more firmer and accurate um, implant placement. Once inserted with high initial stability, we did a dual zone grafting as per Stephen Chu and Dennis Tarno. Temporary cylinder was attached and an immediate temporary crown fabricated. This is just a stock image of one of my other cases with a, a, a titanium cylinder in place. And you can see the, the maintenance of the contour from sealing that, that chamber, as Paul might say, um, after three months of healing. So in essence, the aim of this study was to determine, was there a statistical significant difference? And we can see from the results that there wasn't. So we can easily take this back to our own clinics and uh, apply it on a day-to-day -day basis. The results of our, this study were in, in keeping with a, the, the most up-to-date meta-analysis as well that we could find. Um, so we know that our, our, our testing or our processes were all uh, validated and correct. There were a few limitations I found, you know, being a private practitioner and do, not doing this in a university setting is <laughs> due to the financial constraints. Um, a single kit was used for all of the osteotomies and the resin that we tend to use for printing models, it's a very homogeneous, dense material. So the dulling effect on the, the drills may have had an effect during the actual, um, during the actual, the, the multiple osteotomies needed, but also in terms of seating the implant and that may well attribute to uh, be, be responsible for the, the outliers in the, um, the, of global coronal uh, deviation, because trying to actually get those implant analogs to see is very, very challenging. So within the limitations of this study, you can conclude that there's statistically no difference between the desktop and commercially produced guides. And I have to give thanks to Ulf Neveling in um, Digident in Germany for helping me with the production of all the um, SMOP guides and the design of those guides and, and the access to the software on his side. What I would like to add to the end of it is, is the pitfalls of guided surgery, as I do have issues with the, the marketing of guided surgery, uh, you know, by say implant reps and companies in that it's uh, marketed as a substitute for surgical skill, prosthetic skill planning. There are so many, the, 
errors within guided surgery are cumulative. So every step along the way has the potential to introduce an error and you could have a catastrophic cascade of errors if you don't know what you're doing. Briefly, we've got each step. So we've got the radiological examination. We could have, there is a certain accuracy associated with the actual radiographic image itself um, up to 0.2 millimeters for a CBCT. The artifact in a heavily restored mouth, there are specific protocols to try and avoid or compensate for the artifact um, so that a guided surgery can still be performed and obviously movement and movement and positioning. In terms of planning, as you can see from the image on the um, right hand side, the implant is basically squeezed in between two cortical plates. Now from a clinical perspective and having done many guided surgeries, I know that as soon as my guided drill hits the top of that slope ridge, it's going to go one way or the other. And again, you need the surgical experience to know how to deal with that or if things are going wrong to be able to actually deviate from the guided plan and go with a, a non-guided plan. Within the actual manufacture of the guide itself, we obviously have tolerances within the printers. As we mentioned, we're using my thesis was using a, a cheaper printer and there was a lot of large learning curve in trying to establish the, the protocols to print accurately in there. And again, if you're not used to that, you may produce a guide which is very, very uh, inaccurate. There's been large reports of guide fracture because the actual materials we use for um, printing guides um, are relatively brittle. So reports say between six and 7% of fractures also, <clears throat> we have to consider the supporting tissue of the guide. As I mentioned, I selected toothboard guides because I, the literature shows they are the most accurate form of guide. Um, Mucosa-borne or bone-borne guides um, uh, don't show the same degree of accuracy for a variety of reasons. Obviously, mucosa is somewhat compressive and bone <coughs> has quite a, a regular surface but also it needs very, very large flap reflection to actually achieve a truly um, bone supported guide. Other pitfalls of guided surgery, intraoperatively, seating the guide correctly, which can be challenging. And sometimes you can falsely think that you have it seated and in areas where opening or posteriorly actually concentrically drilling as opposed to putting eccentric forces on the, the drill sleeve itself and cause massive deviation. Bony necrosis from irrigation, from lack of irrigation, adequate opening, which was my very, very first failing with guided surgery when I tried to replace a lower seven with guided surgery, just doesn't happen sometimes. Component tolerance, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a tolerance between the sleeve and the guide and the guide, uh, the sleeve and the actual drill itself. So trying to refine those and find a system that you find is, um, is adequately equipped to deal with all of those is very, very important. And also the anatomical considerations, as I mentioned, sloping ridges um, and also things like the bone itself. It's not a, a completely homogeneous material where it drills evenly through. We obviously have our cortical layers and our cortical plates and trabecular areas and what happens is sometimes these will tend to uh, drive us off our our actual path and lastly we have operator experience as i said it's not a substitute for surgical experience um uh, an article by cassetta they um, <coughs> noted that um it doesn't allow surgeries that can't be done with conventional implantology to be completed it just simplifies those complex steps <coughs> As for the future, naturally, um, digital planning, surgical guides, that leads us nicely into, you know, the realm of pre-made prosthetics, trying to have everything ready to go, because as many of the other surgeons will know that the, um, the surgical, surgical aspect can sometimes be very, very easy, but the restorative part, not so much. So... On the top right, we've got a, an example of a system newish here in Australia, or Dentes, where there is um, the preoperative planning, surgical planning, and um, a pre pre milled titanium bar is delivered on this day of surgery, and um, essentially 
uh, bring the surgery day down to just one single sitting. And on the lower right hand side, you've got the Chrome Guide, which is a bit more popular in the States, um, which basically has everything in, in one go, where you from planning to a uh, fixation guide to a bone reduction guide to uh, a seated temp on, on those. And that's it for my basic, very, very basic presentation on guided surgery. I hope it's given some information. And um, after three or 400 cases of doing that, I feel that I've learned a lot about it. Um, and experience goes a long way in, in those surgeries, much like conventional surgery. So if the guys want to fire any questions my way, I'm happy to do so. Yeah, uh, dear David, thank you very much for this lecture. And don't underestimate, this was well done. Everybody can follow easily. And um, I was also very happy that this kind of lecture is also representing the MOI um, yeah, spirit that we not only talk about the new things, but we also talk about the pitfalls, about the challenges and so on, that we get really a whole picture of this guided surgery and do it very, very well. And now uh, Catherine will moderate the questions for you. Um, yeah, please, uh, Catherine. Uh, which kind of uh, names we have in the chat list. Thank you, Paul. Um, so our first question comes from our MOI, <coughs> Alex Zaretnitsky. By the way, he is representing the MOI with a really good sweatshirt. Alex, you got the microphone. Very good. <laughs> uh, good, mor good morning, everyone. It's uh, 4 a.m. here in Canada. <laughs> uh, but I'm glad I woke up early for your presentation, David. It was really, really good and very useful, I think, for our everyday practice. Uh, my question is very simple, um, perhaps, is once you gain some experience, how long does it take you uh, to produce uh, a guide in-house? Yeah, good. Um, are you talking about in terms of just purely planning or the actual production? Um, I guess both. Yeah, if you could just divide it into how long it takes you to plan and yeah. how long it takes you to produce one. So there was actually in, in some of the research I was doing for this, there was a, a recent article that's quoting up to about 28 minutes for the actual surgical planning. So ju purely just the planning aspect, which they quoted was 10 minutes greater than the average conventional analog type one. Personally, I've made a video for some of my um, MOI colleagues that are in my year and about 15 minutes from start to finish for a simple or a single tooth would be adequate for the actual surgical part or the actual planning part. And then after that, yes, there is a bit more workflow involved. And um, basically you're taking it from to your printer and getting your printer set up and stuff like that. So getting a, getting a good workflow established is, is, is very, very important as well. You know, but about 15 minutes it would take me from start to finish when you talk about importing your DICOM, overlaying your SDL, planning your position, designing your guide, and then to export it. And if you've got a nice fast computer, maybe you could chew a few minutes off that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Okay, Thank you. the next one. Catherine? Um, yes, next question, Hossa. You are giving your hand. If you could please activate your microphone, then the next question is yours. Unfortunately, your microphone still deactivated. <coughs> I gave it to you, but you have to click taking the microphone. Go to the left corner. Yes, now left it's good. Corner. I think you... Yeah, now we hear you, Rosa. No, we don't hear you. No, we don't. <laughs> the microphone's not working, actually. Sorry about that. If you want to, you can put your questions in the chat, and I can read it out loud for you, OK? But first, we make a next uh, question until he read write his uh, question to the chat. Is there any more? Next question is from you, Paul, actually. Ah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, David, I have two questions. First of all, um, what do you think about, you have already mentioned the cooling aspect, yeah? Now we have more uh, uh, better working templates, uh, which are like a skeleton, and you can cool better. And mm -hmm. Uh, so you can flap rising and so on, but we have two different opinions in our kind of uh, family. 
first of all, I now change more and more the last years to the punching technique, if it's possible. So we only punch mm -hmm. the, the soft tissue in the diameter a little bit less than the final abutment diameter to have a very nice uh, primary healing and attachment. Uh, yeah. And the other say, no, no, uh, I still go on with my with my flaps. Uh, so what is your opinion? Because uh, you have a lot of experience and a lot of learning curve and you tell it us uh, with your pitfalls too um, about these two aspects. Flap versus okay, so, uh, uh, punching technique. Personally, I've seen too, not in my own hands, but I've seen too many errors from other clinicians in a, in a flapless scenario. But again, that comes back to my initial complaint about the marketing of guided systems. So it's it's those those clinicians who are inexperienced then performing a, a a flapless surgery. Okay, whereas in the hands of someone who's experienced, like the guys in your department and yourself, I think look, yes, performing a a flapless surgery is 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 a reasonable treatment option. I have done quite a few immediate extraction guided then surgeries, mm -hmm. and I don't have any issue doing that. What are the ways that we could potentially compensate for that? You did mention the skeleton type guide where essentially the guide tube is elevated from the surgical guide with, uh, with space around. There's an also within the design software, if you can imagine perpendicular to your guide tube, you can actually place technically another custom implant the same dimension as your external irrigator on your implant handpiece. And you can actually physically connect that into it. So it irrigates directly into the, um, the osteotomy. Mm -hmm. And personally, I don't, I do a different drilling protocol myself anyway. I usually perforate cortically, but then I actually run a very, very slow, um, and without irrigation in most instances. Um, so to try and prevent overheating and it also makes it a lot easier that there's not the irrigation there. It's contentious, um, but in terms of have I seen overheating or failures from that, not that I could ever really attribute, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a number of ways around that. Also another uh, proprietary system, the R2 gate, I believe may well, which is a, a double pinned system and um, it may well um, circumvent the, the issues with the um, irrigation. Yes. Yeah. Which allows a lot so more there, easy not the, the, not the, the drill is guided or the whole handpiece is guided with these two pins, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. good. Um, thank you very much for this uh, nice answer. Uh, Catherine, do we have now the yeah. written uh, question to David? Um, yes, I got the question, but Hossa, I think actually you try again because I could hear you before. You can hear me now? Yeah, yes. you know. Okay. No. Oh, thanks, God. Okay. Hello, everyone. Yeah, lovely to see you all. Yeah. Thank you, David, for a very interesting uh, lecture. So my question, while you are using the guide and you're doing the implant, if you're doing the implant at the site and, and you found there is a problem in the bone, how you change the, the site of the implant and you have the guide during doing the surgery? This would be a big dilemma. That's why I, I feel the guide is more pushing from the companies. This is mm. my feeling. Look, I think proper assessment, uh, pre-operative assessment of your site is going to yes. help you to, and, and, and again, with experience, understanding the difficulties that you may face. So say, for example, like Paul mentioned, or on the case I showed, an immediate extraction case, you have to anticipate that as soon as you start to drill, your guided drill is going to be deflected by the palatal bone, deflected buccally, and they're the kind of situations that can cause an absolute disaster with buccal perforation and buccal placement of your implant. So trying to anticipate those in your planning and not just relying solely on the guide, but on your own surgical experience and being aware of that during the surgery. Or, and that's one of the good things about having control about it is yourself is, you could maybe even compensate slightly by changing your osteotomy direction ever so slightly um, to try and accommodate for something like that. Say, for example, conventionally doing a freehand um, immediate placement in the anterior zone, 
we make a, a mark on the, the palatal wall that we want to engage and then tend to change our angle as we as we um, perform our osteotomy so that we don't slip down that palatal wall and you can even create a separate guide to actually create that initial um, initial osteotomy hole. Okay. And that's the good thing about having control of the system yourself, that you can, as a clinician, are able to give your expertise. Whereas with the externally sourced one, often it's someone with absolutely no clinical knowledge just telling you where an implant needs to go. You know? Good. We've lost you again, but hopefully that was... Okay, so uh, now time is running, David. Once again, I clap my hand. Really good job, and I'm proud that uh, you'll be one of these uh, hopefully alumni with as an ambassador of our program in Australia and all over the world. If you're invited on the stage, now we come to the next speaker. Uh, this is uh, Goraz Danilovsky, and uh, he's coming from Slovenia. And here in Ljubljana, the main city of Slovenia, he graduated in uh, seven years ago. And he is also finishing the same time like David in September 2019, so last year. And he's working since 2015 with implants uh, and is uh, also with digital dentistry familiar, with guided and, of course, with PRF. And this is also this uh, kind He's eager to do something on research, learning in biomassa thesis, and therefore he presents us the results and also the method of his master thesis. His question or his hypothesis is comparison of solid PRF, medium RCF, in combination with bone substitute material versus bone substitute material as graft material for internal sinus lift. And he presents you a pilot study. Uh, yeah, uh, dear Goras. Uh, it's your turn now. We'll try to share your screen that you can start with your lecture. Yes. Okay, it works. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, can you speak okay. a little bit louder? Or okay, yeah. So, uh, hello everyone, I'm Goraz Danilovsky and <clears throat> um, um, as Professor Weigel mentioned, I'm MY217, and I'm also ICOI diplomat. Um, I come from... Wow, he's frozen. Ljubljana, Slovenia, so a beautiful city, you should come visit. Uh, the comparison, do you see it? Okay, guys, I think Goraj is having some problems with your bandwidth. Sorry, Goraj, we have a problem hearing you. Um, can anybody turn your videos off? I will also turn everybody's videos off, okay? Except for Goraj, of course. But I think it will help with the internet connection. Okay, Goraj, you please go on. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the topic is the comparison of... Uh, PRF with combination with bone substitute material versus bone substitute material alone as grafting material for internal sinus lift procedures, where RCF is uh, relative centrifugation forces, which was um, introduced by my mentor, that's Professor Ganati, in one of his recent studies. Um, that's just a way how to prepare the PRF. Um, so we all know what PRF is. Uh, it's a Tolgen's fibrin matrix. It contains a lot of platelets and leukocytes um, and growth factors, cytokines, uh, which are pretty much uh, very important with tissue regeneration. And um, after teeth extraction in the upper uh, posterior uh, region, we often get a lot of bone recession and the sinuses expand. And there is often the need for augmentation in terms of uh, sinus lifting to gain some proper volume of bone to put the implants. So sinus lifts um, are pretty common. Um, and the PRF is an interesting thing when, uh, which can be added to these grafting materials to help with the bone regeneration. Uh, the, I assess the, the bone regeneration 
uh, with uh, ISQ. So I measured the implant stability of all the implants I place in this uh, lifted sinuses uh, with the ISQ from Ostel. So this is what I use, the Ostel ISQ. And uh, this is the uh, PRF Duo Centrifuge from Shukrun, which is used to produce the PRF matrices. Um, so the aim of uh, the study was to evaluate the role of PRF at increasing the implant stability after internal lift procedures with immediate implantation, where the PRF was added to the grafting material. And the hypothesis is that adding the PRF to the grafting material um, uh, for the internal lift with immediate implantation improved the implant stability during the early healing period. Early healing period here means uh, four to eight months after the implant placement. Uh, so this is my material and methods. I had 13 patients and I performed a total of 18 procedures that were all included in this study. I use Ostem implants. So um, all the implants placed were from Ostem and they were from different diameters because of course we have different ridges, different anatomies. So I couldn't stick to one single dimension for every case. So all the implants were 3.5, 4.0, 4.5 and 5.0. Uh, I did the the sinus, uh, the internal sinus lift, I did it with the help of uh, the cat. Hello. Hmm. Okay. Hi. Do you do you see me? Yeah. yeah now we see it again. We lost uh, your presentation for a second, but now it's back. Don't worry about it. Oh. Okay. So I can continue. Oh. Uh, um. All right. Sorry. Well, um, yes, yeah, so I use this kit, which includes the hydraulic lifter to safely uh, detach the membrane from the sinus floor. And the sub sinus cavity was then filled with grafting material. In uh, terms of grafting material, I divided the patients into two groups. So I had the test group and <clears throat> the control group. In the test group, I used to mix the PRF with bone substitute material. And in the control group, I only used bone substitute material as a grafting material. So then I measured the ISQ of all the implants placed immediately after placement and then after another ISQ measurement after four to eight months. And I compared these results and I used them for statistical analysis. This is the study design. So uh, all the patients needed internal lift and implantation, two groups with different grafting materials, immediate implant placement, with ISQ and then another ISQ measurement after four to eight months and data analysis. So now I'm gonna show you some case reports, clinical stuff. Uh, this is a patient I chose because it's quite interesting because I did uh, one six and two six. So I did it on the two sides and the same patient was included in both groups. So I did one six with PRF and two six without PRF. I did a pre-op CBCT where I did some analysis of the bone. And um, as we can see, this is the region 1.6. Uh, the bone width was 7.5 millimeters and the bone height was 6.5. And on the other side, this is the 2.6. We had similar bone, so a little bit less uh, of height. Maybe it was 6 millimeters and width was also 6, but it's quite similar to the other side. Um, this is how I prepared the PRF. First do the phlebotomy, drain blood <clears throat> from the patient, then put it in the centrifuge. And then we separate the yellow from the red stuff and put it in the PRF box, put the cover on, let it be for 10 minutes, and then you get nice mattresses, which can be then used for clinical application. Uh, this is the incision foot uh, thickness flap at region 1.6. This is actually at least two implants here, one five and one six, but one five is irrelevant. Uh, so we're just gonna move to one six. And this is the hydraulic lifter that was used to detach the membrane. So it just ejects saline into the sinus. 
and it helps with membrane detachment. Um, I also did the Valsava maneuver just to make sure that there was no membrane perforation present. And this is the preparation of the graft material for site 1.6. So I mixed the PRF mattress with the synthetic bone graft, which is 75% hydroxyapatite and 25% beta TCP. I tried to mix it in one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, then I inserted the, the grafting material into the sinus with the special uh, carrier and condenser. And I placed a 4.0 by 10 implant. As we saw before, the native bone height here was 6.5. So there was a slight elevation of 3.5 millimeters. Uh, everything was sutured up. And I did the measurement of the ISQ. At this stage, we had 74, which is quite well. Then we moved to the other side. This is the same patient, region 2.6, also full thickness flap the same uh, protocol to elevate the membrane with the hydraulic lifter. And here, as you can see, the grafting material is just the synthetic bone graft. It's the same one that was used on the other side, just without the PRF. Implant placement, 4.0 by 8.5, <clears throat> and all sutured up. And ISQ reading at this site was 79 at the time of implant insertion. This is a post-operative CBCT. Uh, we can see 1.6 with uh, uh, the elevated membrane and the bone grafting. And well, we cannot see the PRF on the X-ray, but it's there. And the 2.6 is just the bone particles inside the sinus. Uh, this is the prosthetic protocol. The patient showed up, came back after four months. Uh, so I... Mm, switch the healing abutments to a wider diameter once to get a better emergence profile. That's what I usually do. And this is after three weeks, he showed up. So we have a better emergence profile for the molars, especially. Uh, I did another ISQ measurement at this point for both implants. So we see one six here. We have um, 84, which is quite an increase from 74. And on the 2.6, I got a 77, which is quite similar to the one I got at insertion, and that was 79. Uh, this is the impression with the trios, and um, I, I did a cir full zirconia crowns, glued to tie bases. If I did it today, I would make them all singles, but then I split it. Uh, this is what it looks in mouth at uh, crown delivery. And um, here we got a, a X-ray that I did at crown delivery. So that's actually almost six months after implant placement. And we can see new bone formation around the implants 1.6 and 2.6, which are visible on the X-ray. Um, and then I did another X-ray just last month control panoramic is this one. Uh, this is actually two years after implant placement. So we can see that the bone already matured and there is new bone formation around implants 1.6 and 2.6 and everything looks stable. So I'm happy for now. And we'll just keep um, controlling this patient, see the long-term results. Um, now, this is just one of the cases that I showed. Now, I did, uh, I did this with uh, 13 patients. And all, then I compared the results. And the results showed that um, there is some tendency that adding the PRF matrices to the bone graft material have a positive influence on the implant stability, ISQ reading. So the variables were normally distributed and therefore analyzed by the quantitative student's t-test. And so statistical significance for all tests was set at p value less than 0 0.05. So the data showed that our results were correct in 95% of the cases. Uh, this is easier to imagine here. Um, on the left side, we see the ISQ stability reading. The black is at insertion and the gray is at um, the second stage after four to eight months. 
So um, we see that in the test group, we had a bigger improvement of the ISQ than in the control group, which is um, even more visible on the right graph, where we can see the ISQ improvement in uh, percentage. So for the test group, it was almost 19 to 20. And in the control group, it was about 15. Um, no, the discussion part. So the purpose was uh, to evaluate the potential of the press PRF matrices in combination with beta TCP synthetic bone graft material to enhance uh, bone regeneration in internal sinus lift uh, elevation with immediate intern placement. Now, as we know, the PRF is slowly releasing high concentration of cytokines and growth factors. So these migrating cells, which are important in bone generation, um, are in near proximity of PRF matrix and in constant environment with fibrin and growth factors during their entire maturation cycle. Uh, so yeah, the, this was assessed then by the ISQ readings at insertion and four to eight months later. Uh, of course, there were many limitations to this study. Um, it was a small amount, a small number of patients that I could include. I had, uh, yeah, just 13 patients because I had to uh, finish it on time and I had to get uh, ethical committee approval from my country because this is actually a study that was done on live patients. So that took some time. So I actually had less than one year to, to make uh, <clears throat> all these cases. Um, and I couldn't really schedule a strict um, time frame for the second stage to all of them because you know it's working with people and some of them just didn't come back after four to eight months. Some of them came back after one and a half year for the second part and I couldn't include them in the studies. So there was uh -huh. a drop off. Um, cool. Another limitation is that we're uh, the residual reach has different anatomy with different patients, and that's why I had to use different diameters of implants. So this might have also influenced the results. And the implant stability at insertion also heavily depends on surgical techniques. So we can do like under preparation, or we can do bone condensation with the dense suburbs, and then you get a great primary stability, which will show on the ISQ. Um, so the conclusion is that within the limitation of this study, we can conclude that the addition of the press PRF matrices to the bone grafting material results in bigger increase of the ISQ after the initial healing period of four to eight months in the test group. However, no statistically different a significant difference was determined in the parameters observed in the present studies. Um, I did found out that the PRF matrices, um, in addition to the bone graft material, offers better handling and manipulation of the grafting material its own. Um, and considering all this information, we can say that the PRF seems to have a positive influence on the new bone formation in the sinus lift and it improved the handling, it improved the healing. And I think it also reduces the treatment time in the initial healing period. And on the long run, I guess, um, it's, uh, the, bones, the, the bone would regenerate anyway with or without the PRF. But on the short notice, I guess it's, it helps with bone regeneration. Well, that's everything from my side. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jagorats, especially also for keeping in time uh, for your nice prepared lecture. So we overcome the internet uh, yeah, limitation um, by switching off the videos of the participants, but they can follow them better and clear your presentation. So uh, Catherine, I handle over if there are any questions uh, for Goraz, uh, please uh, hand over to the participant who asked him some <coughs> lecture. Thank you, Paul. Um, first question comes from our MOI student, Dr. Jawad Anka. 
Jawad, you got the microphone. Hi, 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 hi everyone. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, we have in our clinic uh, sometimes that I thought, I thought the evaluation of the time, the timing of taking the PRF, we haven't any consideration for the timing because what's the difference between fresh PRF and old one? How it's working? We haven't any research. This is my question. Um, well, I mean, once you prepare the PRF, uh, once you drain the blood and do the centrifugation, so it takes like 10 minutes to get it done. And I've read that it stays fresh and it can be used for at least an hour, an hour and a half after that. Uh, it shouldn't dry out. So that would be some time frame when to use it. And if you plan to use it like after six or seven hours, I guess it's not longer useful because it's going to be dry. Yeah, what? Is this an answer for you? You yes, look like you have a... But, uh, is, is there any research for that? I don't think that we have a research. Shukran even, the, the machine cannot give us any limit time for the uh, old and fresh PRF. I asked him this question and he didn't answer me, answer me quite. What do you think, Paul? Is a question on me? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know also any literature on that, um, but I have another uh, idea for this uh, PRF. Uh, Goraz shows very nicely that there is an improvement uh, in ISQ, which is uh, working a little bit faster. And his two-year result from one of his study, uh, party pigeon, um, so in the end, we have the same. So um, what is the indication of PRF? Look, if you have a very old patient, you have a diabetes, or you have uh, other, let me say, b phosphonate history, and all these things are a little bit, um, yeah, um, decrease uh, healing velocity and healing capability. Uh, this means that the PRF, I think, will help to overcome these compromised patients, especially also for implant placement. And I think there is a high potential for PRF. But if you have healthy patients, this kind of uh, improvement or increasement is small, but uh, still visible. And uh, Gorat shows us nicely that it's visible. And therefore, I cannot answer uh, if there is any literature between the new, fresher PRF and what you say, old PRF. Um, I, I don't know, but what we can do, I, I can, in the, in the lunch break, I can ask uh, Sharam, because he's still on the OP theater, uh, because he is one of the experts worldwide for PRF and he developed very well, you know, and perhaps can, he can help better than me. Thanks. Sir. Okay for you? Thank you. No problem. Okay, the, uh, Catherine, have you another question? Yes, we have more questions. Um, the next question comes from our MOI student, Dr. Aditya. Aditya, mm -hmm. you have the microphone. Hello. Yeah, Hi. hello. Okay. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Koras. When you use the crystal approach sinus leaf, uh, do you use only liquid PRF or you use also the solid PRF too? The solid you will, the liquid you mix with the bone material and the solid you put it inside the socket or only use the liquid PRF? Yeah. Well, no, I, I actually use the solid one that you I only mix. Use. Yeah, I use the solid uh, mattress, press mattress that I mix with the bone particles, and then that was used uh, as a grafting material. Oh, okay. And do you use the red tube, the non-coated ETA for the plebotomy? Hmm? For uh, plebotomy? Yeah. yeah. The, yes, I used the, the, back then I used the red tubes, yes. That okay. was what I got with the machine. Oh, okay. But what if we use the uh, tube that is coated with uh, ETA, the the, pur the purple tube? Have you ever used it before for plebotomy to, for taking the PRF? Uh, to be honest, I have it in stock, but I, I never used it, no. Oh. Okay. 
Yeah, that's all my question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the next question comes from uh, our MOI graduate, Dr. Abdul Fattah from Jordan, who visits us from space apparently today. <laughs> Dr. Abdul Fattah, you have the microphone. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Nice. Yeah. Very nice to meet you again. I feel like we are like each and every year. Uh, it is not a question how much it is a, an observation. Your dear doctor, your first uh, case, uh, the pre-op uh, X-ray uh, CBCT, uh, you can observe a little bit some thickness of the membrane. But the uh, uh, post-op, the thickness, the, 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 the sinus was very clear. Uh, this suggests that the PRF uh, can work well in healing the uh, Schneiderian membrane. Do you agree with me or not? Thank um, you. Yeah. Well, I also prescribe antibiotics. Uh, amoxicillin with every patient they do the sinus lift and I also told him to quit smoking or at least to reduce it a little bit and I, this, I think this also helped at removing the uh, possible sinus infection but to be sure that the PRF healed the sinus infection I, I don't really think we can say that for a hundred percent Mm. Yes, uh, there there is no no study for this. Uh, if PRF if uh, will PRF uh, will um, yeah improve this kind of uh, healing of an infected sinus, but nevertheless you know if you know that the sinus is infected, you should not do a sinus floor elevation. Yeah, you should first uh, heal the sinus. I think this is clear. Um, can I have a next question to you? Um, the point is the following. Um, uh, you use your synthetic uh, bone graft material and it's okay. And you make a very nice comparison. But uh, which kind of feeling you have because you work with the PRF and with this uh, stiff PRF. Um, if you don't uh, add this uh, bone material, so you make a so-called summer technique without blood, but uh, the blood is already PRF. So you place only PRF in the sinus after you lifted it with this hydraulic uh, yeah, approach? Uh, or is it uh, not working because this uh, membrane comes back and will squeeze and push press, uh, your, your PRF? What, what, what is your meaning on that point? Because if the patient can save the money for the uh, graft material, mm, perhaps he is happy. Um, well, I mean, yeah. I'd never done it only with PRF. I always put something in. Uh, so also with the hydraulic lift, it is another uh, disadvantage or because you never know where the membrane will detach. So it can go one way or another. So if you put a lot of saline inside, it can just go to a completely different direction than you want it to go. And it's quite unpredictable, I would say. And using only PRF, I think it would it might work because, I mean, the the point is just to keep the the space from the membrane collapsed, so it, some bone regeneration can happen in that space, right? Mm, okay, because um, if you have uh, if you had time, or I don't know if you joined it, or you can even read the record in the. Moodle platform in our MOI family, we have some webinars and recently uh, Kenneth Lee uh, show us uh, PRF and uh, the new um, yeah, kind of uh, approaches and he shows us that uh, he cook PRF and then it goes very stiff, right? So the, the, the resistance against mechanical pressure is nicely because this uh, is sometimes used also in the plastic surgery for cosmetic surgery in the face. However, this is not the topic of the day, but I think this kind uh, can be um, a, a new approach in the future. And perhaps you are eager to invest this, uh, to, to, to evaluate and uh, to, yeah, to work out this tool um, in the next study, if you do, <laughs> I hope so. Um, 
Um, yeah, and uh, perhaps we can then only use PRF in another sticky um, yeah, so, so situation. Good. Uh, Katrin, do we have uh, another questions for him? Um, no, at the moment we have no other questions. So I would suggest that we go into our first break. Or Paul, do you have another question? No, I don't have. And um, I hope, uh, please stay all in uh, and then go make your biology break or eat something or play with your kids or whatever. But stay <laughs> in, this, uh, uh, in this Zoom meeting because um, yeah, after the break, uh, Tony, a friend of mine, Tony Skullian, our main speaker, which we invite him, uh, is speaking and give his lecture and talk with us all and have a nice question and answer session too. So I hope you come all back or stay in. Um, yeah, and I handle over to Catherine if um, uh, you have something to add for our participants now. Um, no, Paul basically said it all. You may stay in the meeting. We will just turn the cameras and microphones off for a second, but we'll all stay here in the room. And our keynote speaker, Professor Anton Skulian from the University of Bern, uh, will start his lecture in about 30 minutes, 12.30 German time. All right. Okay. Thank you guys See you. so much. See us in 30 minutes again. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Hallo, Professor Skulian. Hallo, Frau Jackel. Alles gut? Ja, alles gut. Hallo, Professor Weigel. Ich höre dich nicht. Hallo, Toni. Ah, okay, super. Ja, die gaben mir jetzt erst den Ton, weißt du? Meine Mitarbeiter bestimmen über mich. Okay. Also ich habe jetzt versucht, alles so gut es geht. Ja, ja, wir sehen dich gut. Ist gut? Ja, ein bisschen lauter vielleicht. So ist gut? So ist gut, ja. Warte, so. Mhm. Ist gut? Mhm. Warte noch eine Sekunde. Ja. Äh, Katrin, willst du dann die ersten Worte sagen? Ja. Alles gut. Okay. Habt ihr mehrere Vorträge gehabt heute? Ja, schon zwei. Mhm. Und dann nach dir sind noch mal zwei. Ah, okay. Und du bist genau in der Mitte. Ich bin in der Mitte, okay. <lacht> okay. So, we have to switch now to English. Yeah. Um, yes, guys, because with our next speaker from Switzerland, we are on very Swiss time. So perfect timing, actually. And uh, we will start the meeting again now. And um, Dr. Weigel, as always, will introduce our keynote speaker. Paul? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. And uh, we see all a lot of uh, comes back uh, to our online congress of the MOI, Innovation Jumps in Oral Implantology 2020. So Professor Dr. Anton Skullian, Uh, we'll talk about etology, prevention, and treatment of mucosal recession at dental implants. And also we include some cases from students and we'll discuss later on perhaps 20, 30 minutes. Um, yeah, hopefully very interactive. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I have to tell you a little bit about uh, Anton Skullian and about his CV. However, um, I can tell you if I talk about everything, uh, It will be a lecture for its own, so we don't have time for the lecture for him because he has a very long role, what he is doing and awards and so on. Currently, he is professor and chairman of the Department of Periodontology in Bern in Switzerland. And he is also the CEO of the School of Dental Medicine in Bern. And he has uh, made more than 400 articles in peer-reviewed journals. Once again, 400. Yeah, and 30 chapters in textbooks and had this delivered, um, yeah, he has made more than 500 lectures. He is also the editor of the book Periodontal Regenerative Therapy and guest editor of the Periodontal 2000 issued entitled Wound Healing in Periodontology and Implantology. And I think this is also his focus in his research today. Um, he is also surfing on the board of 12, you hear right, 12 dental journals. So I think if you now place any kind of science or uh, scientific paper, um, it's a very high probability that he get it also on his desk. Yeah, and to sum all up um, is uh, so-called age index is uh, about 78 in Google Schooler. I think nobody has more and uh, the web of science is 57. But uh, what we call internally in the science community in dentistry, uh, this is a Nobel Prize for the science community in dentistry. It's a distinguished scientific award of the International Association of Dental Research, the ERDR. He is uh, handed over last year and I think he can very proud of this. And we are very proud that he's lecturing for us. And um, yeah, he is also, a Distinguished Teacher Award of the European Orthodontic Society and some other rewards and yeah, prizes. Other jobs, um, of course, he is uh, leading and um, yeah, also organizing some associations. So he was a past president of Periodontal Research Group of the RDR 
He was past president of Swiss Society of Periodontology and European Federation of Periodontology. And currently, he is a president of the International Academy of Periodontology. So I think you now have a small picture about his work. And he is a scientist and he is a clinician. If you see his cases and his hands, you will be very astonished. And because he's so good in hands too, and in research and also in the surgical, um, um, let me say, uh, teaching, his cases are not only uh, for the first second, he can show you also five, 10, 15, 20 year results, which are still looking amazing. So Tony, uh, this was my introduction for your lecture. Um, I think we have to share now your screen uh, for the first slide. And then uh, we are really welcome you for your lecture and later on with the discussion with the students and me about the issues you mentioned in your lecture. So. Yes, we have you. One second. Yeah. No, this is not the end. <laughs> Go to the, to the first slide, yeah. Uh, I can also say, please, uh, you can ask him during the lecture by the chat, only put your name like the other lectures before. And then uh, uh, after the, he's stopping, uh, we will ask you for your lecture, for your question. Uh, so you can do it also me, uh, between his lecture and uh, we are appreciate your questions, of course. Yeah? And uh, question him hard uh, and also sometimes provocative because we want to have a very nice discussion um, yeah, because we have so many things which are controversially um, discussed and also published. And now I think, Tony, you are ready to start. Yes. Thank, thank you very much, uh, okay. uh, Paul, uh, for, first of all, for inviting me to your Congress and uh, giving me this opportunity to talk um, uh, for your students and uh, in front of you. And uh, maybe the most important uh, aspect that we need to mention is that we are friends. And uh, I feel privileged to have friends like you. And this is, I think, most more important than the papers. So um, <laughs> let's uh, uh, start, dear colleagues. Um, I would like to uh, give you an overview about how we um, diagnose which uh, problems we face when we are dealing with soft tissue recessions at uh, implants, uh, but also to make some uh, comparisons between teeth and implants, and then to elaborate on the different uh, treatment modalities. Of course, this topic is very broad and we could talk uh, for, uh, for hours. However, I would like to uh, show you now some cases and uh, you see what we would like to aim in our clinic uh, is to have a stability of the heart tissues and of the soft tissues following placement of an implant. You can see here one example at baseline and then after 10 years regarding hard and soft tissues. So what our aim is, is to ensure long-term uh, functional and aesthetic success. And uh, we know that we have uh, um, the situation of the bone, we need to ensure the osseointegration. integration. We know a lot about this, but we also uh, focus more and more in the last years on the so-called uh, soft tissue integration, which uh, um, seemingly appears uh, a quite important uh, aspect for the long-term outcomes. Uh, the stability of the hard and soft tissues uh, are of course uh, very, very important. And on long-term basis, uh, we can discuss uh, the issue of probing uh, later. Uh, we uh, would like to have a situation that is inflammation uh, free. And look at uh, some examples, uh, cases that were uh, treated and documented uh, over the years. At one year, we always try to uh, look at the same parameters at 10 years, then at uh, uh, 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, 
And what I want to have in my patient is to have this stability. And this is very important. So uh, uh, when we place the implant, we want to have a stable clinical situation. Uh, we talk nowadays uh, also about the so-called biological width, the supracrestal soft tissue. And uh, this will also change during the so-called remodeling phase. And uh, we would like to avoid uh, recessions of the soft tissue over time. You all know uh, the so-called aesthetic parameters, the white and aesthetic score. And I think it's very important uh, to think at these parameters when we uh, plan our cases. So this is a routine case from our clinic. And you see that if the implants are surrounded by keratinized attached soft tissue, we may ensure soft tissue uh, stability, inflammation uh, free um, areas uh, that are very uh, important. And here another case restored with osteointegrated implants at one year uh, and at uh, seven years, at 10 years. And you can see that it is a uh, stability that we can obtain. So we do not aim only at uh, six months or one year or two years, but I would like to have the stability over many, many years. So what is the problem that we face? What is a soft tissue dehiscence or a recession at the tooth as an implant? First of all, if you look at the anatomy and you have learned a lot about this in your course, uh, this is a small summary. We face differences in the blood supply because if you look at the implant side, you have a direct contract between the implant and the bone. You don't have parental ligament and you have, in fact, uh, poorer uh, vascularity, vascularization and the diminished blood supply. This is a very important point to keep in, in mind. And uh, if, for example, we would excise a part of the gingiva at a natural tooth, very often this gingiva comes back, at least partly. If you do the same around an implant, this uh, will be lost. And this is also a very important point to keep in mind. So what is the so-called mucosal seal around the implants? It has two components, the connective tissue and the juncture epithelium. So this is something very important. And if you look now at the histology, you can see that the epithelial layer is a position on the implant surface via hemidesmosomes. It is not a very a strong link. And the collagen fibers, if you go more apically, are oriented parallel to the smooth implant surface. They are not inserting. So this is very important. And if you look now at uh, uh, the inflammation at the uh, uh, tooth, as you can see it on this histological slide, and the same inflammatory lesion at, uh, around an implant, you see that the inflammatory lesion goes faster if you have the same amount of plaque around an implant and reaches the bone compared to the tooth. Because due to the anatomy, the inflammatory infiltrate is much better encapsulated around the tooth than around an implant. So if you look now at gingiva recessions, as you can see it in these uh, particular cases, one lower jaw, one upper jaw, we may have uh, different etiological factors. It can be due to mechanical trauma, like toothbrushing, to periodontitis, to an orthodontic therapy, or maybe an accident, piercing, or different other parameters, or combination of these uh, parameters, even of periodontitis. However, if you look at recessions around implants, you see one case that was referred to us, and I can tell you that I don't like these cases because I will tell you that it is very difficult to treat. So the main key factor for the etiology, you know what it is? It is the dentist, because these implants were placed by somebody. They didn't grow by themselves in the mouth. I never see an implant growing by himself. So what is now the etiology of the, of the recessions around the implant? First of all, treatment planning. Implants are placed far too vestibularly, or there's a lack or insufficient amount of vesticular bone. The implant may be far too wide if there's a discrepancy between implant size and bony envelope, or maybe an inappropriate distance between uh, two implants or implant and tooth, 
or the thick, thickness of the mucosa. Of course, it can be also coupled with perimplant mucositis or perimplantitis or different combinations thereof. Look at this case. This case was referred to me. And in this particular case, the implant was placed incorrectly. You see fall to facially, you have a huge recession. Luckily, the patient covered it with a lip line. But this case, I can tell you, is a mission impossible to treat with a soft tissue graft. We will discuss it later. Or this case, you see here also the implant was placed a little bit too uh, buckly, uh, or also in this particular case. And also the diameter was maybe too wide. This is, for example, a case that we treated uh, many years ago. It was placed uh, far too facially, and uh, we still uh, could correct it. But you see that we don't have a bone loss here. It is not perimplantitis. It is just a kind of dehiscence. So in this particular case, we performed GBR. We opened up. And uh, uh, you can observe that we have a fenestration. However, we have two neighboring teeth that keeps very nicely the soft tissue. This is very important. So it is a single implant between two teeth. So we have a prognosis. We, we may use a GBR. We may use a, a connective tissue graft additionally. And in this way, we were able uh, to uh, correct the situation. OK. What about lack of vestibular uh, bone? If you don't have at least two millimeters of bone vestibularly or even lingually, then uh, we may have a problem. This uh, bone is also stabilizing the soft tissue. And you can see it here. After a couple of years, please observe the dehiscence that occurred. Despite the fact that we had uh, enough keratinized tissue, due to the fact that the bone was lacking, we have uh, quite clearly a recession. Of course, if you use a GBR that we very often use, a contour augmentation, then we have a very nice possibility to reconstruct the bone, but also to maintain the soft tissues. And you all know these uh, uh, cases and these techniques. You look at uh, uh, the bone that uh, was regenerated. And in this case, of course, the soft tissue uh, will remain. You see the stability uh, of the bone. And here, uh, do not, uh, we do not face a facial recession. What about the <clears throat> discrepancy between implant size and bony envelope? This uh, uh, is also a frequent problem. However, in this particular case, uh, you can observe that we have the problem monofacially. We can see the implant, uh, the titanium shining through the uh, tissue. Probably the bone uh, is not any longer there facially. However, we still have it mesial and distally. But it was a kind of mistake. Not a big mistake, it happens. But it is something that occurs. Or look at this case. Here, again, the size of the implant was far too large. And over the time, uh, dehiscence occurred, a kind of fenestration. What about the inappropriate distance between implants uh, or implants and teeth? We know these rules that were described by Danny Boozer. If we don't have enough distance between a tooth and the implant, we lose the papilla. And if we don't have also the vertical height, uh, then we may also end up in a papilla loss. It is even worse if we have two implants that are very close related to each other. Look at this case. These implants were placed lower frontal area. However, they were too close to each other. What happens? The bone resorbed. It was not a perimplantitis. And then the papilla was gone. In these cases, we usually remove one of the implant. We perform a GBR. And we use an implant and a cantilever. Because otherwise, it is impossible to maintain the soft tissues. What about the mucosa thickness? Look at this case. Here, the implant was placed. However, the colleagues looked only at the hard tissue, but they didn't augment uh, the soft tissue. So please keep in mind that you need hard tissue and soft tissue. Otherwise, we end up in this kind of problem. As you can see it facially, we have here a thin uh, um, uh, mobile mucosa. And this kind of fenestration was created over time. And this is a very good niche for, uh, for the bacteria. 
So, of course, we can correct it, and I will uh, show you how we correct these cases. But keep in mind, you need bone, you need correct positioning of the implant, and you need soft tissue. And then we all know uh, the thickness of the mucosa that uh, influences um, also the stability of the bone. And uh, if the mucosa is very, very thin, then we may face also bone loss over time. Look at uh, some cases here, for example, if the mucosa is very thin, or regularly we use a connective tissue graft that is placed on the flap or maybe on the uh, fixed at the cervical part of the implant. And in this way, I have enough thickness of the flap. So we prevent a mucosal recession and of course ensure parental or peri-implant health and also, um, also recession formation. Look at this case, the lack of attached keratinized tissue. The colleague didn't think at this point uh, to ensure enough width of keratinized tissue. And what do we have? Uh, in fact, a problem related to plaque accumulation and uh, of course to recession. Which case is better? Of course, it's not so difficult to tell. If you have enough keratinized stable tissue, it is easier to clean. Sometimes we have also <clears throat> a problem that we can only solve together with a prosthodontist. So if, for example, we have a high smile line, and this case I treated together with uh, Professor Belzer, who is an excellent prosthodontist. So in this case, uh, the implant was placed at uh, the area of 1-1, one, one, and you can see that the cervical contour of the natural tooth is different to that of the implant. It's a small difference, maybe one and a half millimeter. Very difficult to correct. Sometimes small defects are diff more difficult to correct than large defects. So what can we do? In this case, we describe the technique where we, in fact, uh, augment the soft tissue, but I need a very good prosthodontist who is able to fabricate uh, very slender and concave temporaries that will guide the soft tissues. So first of all, we augment. And then this is a very important design of the, of the crown. Uh, you see this um, concavity will guide, in fact, uh, the soft tissue. And this will, at the very end, improve the level of the soft tissue. So sometimes we need to work in teams because as a single person, with one discipline, you cannot cope with all the problems. And this is maybe our strength uh, in Bern. So let me show you a very recent study where we looked at the long-term outcomes of peri-implant soft tissues uh, in terms of mucosa recession. And we had the question whether we need keratinized and attached tissue to maintain long-term soft tissue stability. And if you look at the literature, it was only limited to two papers. I can tell you two papers that were a kind of case series, very little, uh, very little evidence. So we don't have evidence from randomized controlled clinical studies, but if you don't have attached keratinized mucosa around osteointegrated dental implants, these two studies that are available demonstrated more plaque accumulation, more inflammation and more recession indicating that we need, in fact, stable soft tissues. Perimplant mucositis, perimplantitis are also causing recessions. And from a differential diagnosis point of view, we have to make sure whether we are dealing with only soft tissue dehiscence or it is already a perimplantitis or, or a mucositis. Look at this case here. The lady had seven or 10 millimeters of, uh, of uh, pockets and uh, in this case, basically, it was very, very bad to treat, very difficult. So what about the prevention? If you want to prevent recessions around also integrated implants, first of all, look at the positioning of the implant, ensure sufficient vestibular and oral bone, appropriate implant diameter in relation to the bony envelope, sufficient distance between two implants or implants and teeth. Make sure that you have sufficient, at least two, three millimeters attached mucosa and infection control. 
before you place the implant. That means make sure that you have uh, treated, in fact, the perio problem if you have a perio patient. So what is now the treatment goal of recessions? First of all, I would like to help the patient to clean in order to avoid mucositis and perimplantitis, and of course, to improve the aesthetics. And I would like to ensure long-term stability, as you can see it in this case. So if you look now at the study by Rokuzzo and coworkers, he looked at his patients in his practice over 10 years, and he was able to demonstrate that if the implants are not surrounded by sufficient keratinized tissue, you have more plaque accumulation and more problems on a long-term basis. So after he treated these cases with a free ginger graft, he was able to stabilize them. So what do we do? For example, if we are placing implants with GBR, as in this case, I like to use some kind of strip technique. I use a free gingival graft strip or connective tissue graft. Uh, I uh, build up, in fact, the soft tissue over the hard tissue and make sure with some collagen membranes that I can guide, in fact, uh, the, um, uh, the keratinized cells. And I ensure that my implants are surrounded by stable attached mucosa. And this is, in fact, very, very important. Think at this, dear colleagues, not only GBR, but also the soft tissue that we need to obtain. So how do we move on around teeth? Let, just let me summarize our techniques. So of course, we have many, many techniques uh, to treat recessions around natural teeth. What we usually do is the tunneling approaches, because I don't like nowadays to cut the papilla. And uh, of course, if we look now at the cases at single recessions, Usually, I like to use the so-called laterally or coronal advanced uh, um, uh, tunnel. And please look at this case that I treated about five years ago. Very deep recession, about one millimeter. This is uh, a huge defect. And uh, you see the situation. This is a huge defect. And what I do in this case is to preserve the papilla make sure that I, uh, I uh, can prepare a full thickness flap. This is a full thickness tunnel. The tunnel is in fact uh, um, a further development of the envelope technique. And the envelope technique was in fact developed in Frankfurt by uh, Professor Retzke. And in fact, what we do is to, to uh, enlarge uh, an envelope and uh, use a mucoperiostia preparation with specially designed instruments. I am staying on the bone and uh, look how thin the tissue is. In such cases, the tissue is very, very thin. So that's why I don't want to use a split thickness approach because I do not want to perforate the flap. And then of course, it is very important to cut the inserting fibers at the inner part of the, of the flap Sometimes I also remove the muscles with a very long blade, as you can see it here, until I can move the parts of the tissue, uh, the two um, ends of the tunnel together, like a so-called uh, double papilla flap, but without vertical releasing incisions. We may use some biologic materials like uh, uh, endogain, or we can use hyaluronic acid, uh, etc. but in conjunction with a with a soft tissue graft, I fix it. We fix it with a sling suture usually. It is very important to have it fixed. And then I simply move around. It's very important to train this technique. And in the last 12 years since I'm in Bern, I did about 980 cases. And uh, with this technique, these cases are quite successful. But it is very important to look at every uh, single step. So you see, the connective tissue is mandatory in difficult cases. And then at the very end, I just move the, the edges of the flap together by using micro needles. So the needle length is about uh, uh, 12 millimeters. 
just moving it together and making sure that I can, um, can close it as good as possible. You can see it uh, at a high magnification. So uh, this was a 10 millimeter deep recession together with a pocket of four millimeters, 40 millimeter attachment loss. And look at the situation up after about, uh, um, this was after about three years, it's a complete coverage, 100%. So we gained 30 millimeters of tissue. What do we do now uh, in multiple defects? And you see here what, I, what we have to discuss afterwards is, uh, in fact, the results that I obtained with this technique. More than 90% coverage, 96. This is a very good result. Almost in every case, 100%. What do we do now in uh, multiple defects? Of course, we can move the flap coronally according to, to the technique described by Zucchelli and the Sanctis, with or without grafting, or we can also use the tunnel approach, again, with and without the, uh, grafting. And uh, usually I use this approach. Look at this case, a patient that was in fact treated only with composite fillings and she had pain in the lower jaw. So, uh, You can see here exactly the same technique. I don't cut the I don't cut the friend room in a previous surgery. So what I do is to cut the friend room from the inner side. And what I, I call it internal frenulectomy. But what I need is in fact a very long graft. Okay, so I Harvest it from the palate. You can see here uh, a very long incision. So I harvest it from the tuberosity. I go to the central incisor because we need living cells. This is very important. Then I take over the new blade and I split, in fact, uh, the connective tissue from the epithelium. This is, in fact, a kind of split approach and you have to take care, of course, of the palatal artery. That's very important. So you, I just go in a way that I can see my blade shining through. You see the connective tissue graft. And then a third incision. And with this incision, I... Um, in fact, I split the graft from the bone. This is a difficult case because you can see that the palate is a kind of flat palate. And in this case, the palatal artery is very close, you know. So this is a, a challenging uh, case. And of course, this uh, connective tissue was of about four centimeters. This is usually the maximum that we can harvest. We can also harvest another one. Uh, from the other uh, from the other part. So then I always close it, and this uh, harvesting technique has the advantage that I can close this area. So we can theoretically harvest a second time later. You see here the closure, and then you see the tunnel. But again, these are now natural teeth. Okay, so you see. The papillae are there. This is, I consider it very important to have the papilla in place. Have a look at the connective tissue. And then what I do is to pull the connective tissue in the tunnel. First, I use some biologics on the root surface because here the defect went until the apical part of the root. And then the connective tissue is pulled, in fact, inside. It's very important to have a good team, a good assistant, because uh, we need help. They need to pull the graft in the very same moment when I um, want to have it. So uh, not to pull too hard, not to pull uh, too soft. So it has to be coordinated. And you can also see 
the situation when uh, the graft is pulled inside just by a metal suture then we have to make sure that the graft is not uh, uh, turning uh, in fact in the uh, in the tunnel and again we have to move the graft coronally how do we do it this is a very simple technique i just use a slim suture coming from lingually but i take my time to fix it at every single tip at every single tooth so this is very important okay so the suturing technique is very very important i put a lot of emphasis i know that a lot of colleagues when you show them no sutures they are bored because they think okay the the, the surgery is, is done but i can tell you this will give you the final good outcome the sutures so take your time for a uh, good suturing without having any tension in your flat i think this is the key message that i want to tell you and this is uh, the same whether you work uh, or uh, with teeth or with implants without having in fact tension and then we just close the flap laterally you see this is a so-called lateral corona modification that i will publish soon is a, a combination of a laterally closed tunnel and a coronally advanced tunnel so i use an alternate suturing technique if the recession is very deep i close it like that you see like a uh, very simple way with uh, single interrupted sutures and always make sure that uh, the graft is not uh, moving that's very important so that's why i use this um, elevator that will guide in fact uh, my uh, suture and this i do alternating uh, the different recessions okay so uh, you see the coverage and then then if we go now on look at the situation at two years a very nice improvement and the patient can clean much better okay so this is now what we do um, in uh, cases where we have teeth and also in multiple defects my results are more uh, lead to more recession coverage than 90 percent what about now implants so we did a screening of the literature that was published in periodontology 2000 and i can tell you that not much not much recent evidence is uh, uh, since then published but i will show you some new studies as well according to our literature first of all we don't have randomized controlled clinical studies regarding recession treatment around implants then only shallow effects two to three millimeters can be covered predictably no data are available supporting treatment of deep and large recessions at implants so keep in mind this probably due to the uh, to the biology behind let me show you some uh, studies the first study published by Rino Burkhardt more than 10 years ago here he uh, treated 10 uh, uh, patients with one implant you can see that uh, he used a coronally advanced flap and he over contoured the recession okay he covered it 120 percent look at the outcomes after six months more than 30 percent more almost 40 percent was gone after half a year not very good you see and uh, he's an excellent surgeon okay what about uh, some other studies giovanni Tukeli published uh, one nice study 2013 but here he used a combination of a so-called coronal advanced flap and also um, a preparation of the abutment but this is very dangerous because over time it may break however with this technique he obtained a complete recession coverage in 75 percent of the cases and mean recession coverage very good more than 96 percent and uh, if you go now and uh, look at a follow-up paper that looked at these studies you can see that uh, one patient was lost but after five years uh, even more was covered 99 percent is fantastic outcome he's also a very good surgeon but it was a combined approach in rather shallow implants where the implant was placed in an acceptable position 
What about uh, another study Mario Rocuzzo published, uh, a study on 16 patients, coronal advanced flap, harvesting the uh, graph from the tuberosity. And uh, he obtained a mean recession coverage of about 90%. Complete recession coverage was uh, in about 56%, a little bit more than the half. And uh, he, they concluded that this is also a successful approach. But again, they were not very deep recessions and the implants were positioned in a quite acceptable position. And then they looked at the follow-up um, evaluation of this patient cohort. And they found out that complete implant coverage was uh, um, available, was visible in eight out of the 13 defects. That was about 62%. And mean soft tissue dehiscence coverage was about 86%. That was very good. However, don't forget that uh, they have lost um, some patients. They have lost, in fact, three patients because the implants were lost. Uh, so that's very, very important. So not everything is successful. And uh, what, is, uh, what about long-term evidence that the soft tissue may... Uh, may um, um, positively affect the long-term long outcomes around the implants. The evidence is uh, uh, still rather spar sparse, um, but um, we can gain about 1.6, uh, 1.7 millimeter of new uh, keratin as attached uh, tissue. So let me show you uh, our concept. What can we do? If I have this case, so case selection is the most important. Look at this case. This patient received an implant in the frontal area. He lives in the mountains in Switzerland. Nobody sees him. So he was happy with the result. It was not a perimplantitis. When he was laughing, you cannot see the dehiscence. You see this horrible crown. He was then referred to me for um, recession coverage. Everything is wrong in this case. So this is impossible to cover. cover. I didn't, don't even start because I know that I will fail. So here, the only treatment option is explantation if you want to do something good for this patient, okay? However, if I have slight, small dehiscences, you see this case, two millimeters. If the implants are placed in the correct position, however, the soft tissue is very thin, the patient has problems in cleaning, and of course, the the titanium is shining through. So here, what I use is clean the implant surface, use maybe the EMS, the perioflow, you remove the plaque, but I know that we have also better options now in Frankfurt, so I want to learn also those. Um, and then place a connective tissue with a tunnel approach. And this can be successful. After four years, about 1.5 millimeter coverage and increases tissue stability, that's it. It's not a miracle compared to that what I've shown you uh, around the teeth, okay? But it is much more difficult. Another case, look at this situation. The patient has a kind of bone loss facially because the implant was five to one, but he doesn't have any pockets. Why should I remove this implant? To create a huge defect, of course, maybe from a financial po point of view would be better, but he doesn't have problems. He just wants to have more tissue thickness, and he doesn't want to see the titanium shining through. This is very important. If the defect is a, a kind of concave-like one, then we can augment, okay? So here I use, again, the tunnel approach. I keep the papillae, place a connective tissue graft, pull it inside. And what I do is nothing else but implementing that what I've learned in perio surgery to the peri-implant soft tissue surgery. And then I can have an increase in uh, tissue thickness, you see that we have more keratinization and then the prosthodontist can change the crown and then everything would look much better. Or in this case, again, a large diameter implant, but again, no pockets around the implant. Why should I remove it? I would create a huge defect. What I do here again is a connective tissue graft, tunnel approach, and again, I gained about two millimeters, okay? Not 10, but about two. So the patient can clean better. His aesthetic is acceptable. Look at this case. So here again, the implant was placed correctly. Also bone augmentation was done, but they have forgotten to think at the soft tissues. So look at this small dehiscence. 
It is a problem because first of all, the aesthetic is compromised, but then also the cleansability. All the, all the time the patient had some plaque there. So in this case, what I do is to implement the tunnel approach that I've shown you before around teeth to this implant case. I can tell you it is more difficult to treat these cases, okay, around implants, because first of all, it is more difficult to prepare the tunnel due to the fact, that, due to the fact that in fact, here it was already augmented. And always when you go a second time in the same site, you have more scar tissue. So if you want to make this bridge between the natural tooth and the implant surface, you have to make sure that all the fibers are released. Otherwise, it is a horror to, to move, to pull inside um, the connective tissue graft. So then I use a connective tissue. Of course, we have also soft tissue replacement materials, but in difficult cases, in challenging cases, and especially if you are not completely sure uh, that you can close perfectly, then I always recommend to use autogenous tissue. Okay, this is the first choice. So here I pull the graft like a kind of membrane over the surface of the implant, making sure that the graft is not turning I fix it always at one side and then I can stretch it to the other side. So in fact, it is nothing else, but that's what I have uh, shown you before. You see the mattress sutures. I, I prefer to use mattress sutures to, to pull the graft, always coming from the same direction. And I create a kind of membrane or bridge-like structure over, over the titanium. And then my assistant is pulling it. It's very important to stretch very nicely the graft and then to fix it. We don't have to allow for any mobility of the graft. So that's why, again, the same swing suture, you see, I come with a suture, I start um, palatally, I engage the graft, facially, I go around it, engage it at the other line angle. And then I make the knot palatally, okay? So now I have cells. I have connective tissue cells, and these connective tissue cells will create or will enable keratinization, okay? Because they have the genetic information. Then I just try to close the margins of the wound laterally and coronally. Very, very gently. Okay. Okay, like that. Okay. And then at the neighboring teeth, I use a coronally move tunnel. No, everything is stable. This is the big advantage of the connective tissue, of the autogenous tissue. If you have a small dehiscence still, but you have underneath connective tissue, this will keratinize very nicely. Look at this outcome. This is the same crown, nothing must change, and I was able to close this area. Okay, let me come to some conclusions. I hope that I was able to convince you that uh, these techniques are quite predictable. 
for teeth, but also for certain cases around the implants. We may have some new collagen matrices uh, that may serve as replacement materials uh, for connective tissue graft, but also as scaffolds for biologics. Please don't forget to make sure that you have also attached mucosa around your implants, because this will improve your long-term stability. Very, very important. You want to have these patients for 10, 20, 30 years in your practice. So this is extremely important. What about recessions? I have elaborated on the differences in the anatomy between a tooth, between an implant. And for this reason, the healing is also different. And also we have, of course, um, the problem of the, the implant, of the treatment planning that the implants were placed maybe not in the proper position. If you have dehiscences, recessions around the implants, the current evidence suggests that we can only predictably cover small defects. Don't try impossible cases. Two, three millimeters are still fine, even four maybe, if the implant is positioned in an acceptable position. But don't try to, to cover or to imp improve situations that are impossible because this will fail. We still have to go a long way, but uh, I think that uh, keeping in mind these messages, you can improve your uh, treatment um, uh, consent and of course your long-term predictability of your approach. So thank you very much for um, uh, attending uh, this, uh, this um, lecture. If you have any questions, you can write me an email or I have also a Tony Scully Amperio team in the Facebook team. You can also post me something there. But uh, we have also now the cases. I inserted the cases now at the, at the end. I don't know. Uh, uh, do we have a discussion now? Sh should I show you the cases now uh, from the students? Uh, um, yeah, I think uh, we can now have the first questions. Yeah. And uh, after, let me say, five, 10 minutes, we go on with the cases which are provided by our students. But uh, first of all, we will start with one or two questions. Yeah. Um, uh, Catherine, do you have the names that we uh, mm -hmm. call to these yeah. guys here? Yeah. Yes, the first question comes from our MOI graduate and MOI tutor, Dr. Jonas Mohamed. You have the microphone, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you, thank you. Uh, actually, I have a few, few questions. The first question is regarding uh, pre-implantitis. Uh, uh, the first question is, the, uh, do you have uh, or do you see uh, any difference uh, between uh, uh, bone level and tissue level implants? And uh, regarding hex connection versus conical connection, so uh, due to your experience, uh, in case of uh, presence and aggression of preimplantitis. And the uh, second part regarding the tunneling technique, uh, uh, if you use PRF instead of uh, connective tissue graft, and uh, also before inserting the graft, uh, uh, if uh, you make any mechanical or chemical cleaning to the exposed surface of the implant. Very good. Uh, regarding perimplantitis, um, I think that um, if you have a, a tissue level implant, you have uh, usually a more stable uh, st uh, situation regarding soft tissues. So uh, around, uh, it's difficult to give you an answer based on, on, on the evidence, but if you look at the DERS paper and you look at the different implants that were analyzed, uh, then uh, the implants that had a, a tissue level uh, component had the least uh, um, prevalence of pre perimplantitis, um, which indicates, and we, we can also see it in our patient pool, that uh, if you have this polished uh, neck surface, uh, then it's more stable. So uh, we prefer to use uh, tissue level implants whenever possible, of course, Maybe in the aesthetic area, it is not possible, but generally we, we prefer to use tissue level implants. We are more conservative in burn. This can be discussed, but uh, we want to avoid uh, complications as much as possible. And 
uh, our patients, I would say that 95% of our patients are patients that are, uh, have a history of periodontitis. And we know that these patients are a special category of patients, you know, so this is uh, quite uh, uh, tricky. So we want to avoid these complications uh, or to, to reduce them. You cannot perfectly avoid them, but to reduce them as much as possible. The second question was about, uh, regarding uh, the conical and the um, uh, hex, uh, but I can I, I didn't see much uh, difference uh, until now. But um, the data are also not very clear, you know. So this I cannot answer you based on the on the evidence. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I I just would, would like to mention something uh, because if you if you use uh, tissue level implants, uh, so I think it does not matter uh, really if you have hex or conical connection because the connection is uh, uh, not close to the bone. Yeah. But the, the the question was if you use bone level implant, and then the, what's the difference between conical connection and hex connection? Then I think it would be different. For recession coverage, uh, for, for recession development. Yeah, and perimplantitis. Probably yes. I mean, if you if you have the uh, the bone level type, then it's is of course like that. Um, but um, I, in, my, in our material, I can tell you that ninety five percent of the cases that we have in burn are all of them tissue level. So that's why we we avoid bone level um almost always you know so that's that's why i'm not very experienced uh, in in bone level because uh, i can only tell you that what, what we know from the literature and maybe you have more uh, more experience uh, with the ankylo system in frankfurt uh, i think with that system uh, you have a very good uh, uh, stability of the tissues uh, according to that what i know also also from from other colleagues yeah. I don't know, maybe uh, Paul can elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah, the point so is have, uh, very have... nice to, to mention it because uh, in your lecture, and thank you again for this very nice uh, insights of your experience and knowledge, um, you mentioned about uh, the problem if you place two implants very close to each other. Yeah. And uh, what we see, because our students, because we are more or less... Uh, not sponsored by any company, they can use for their cases, they have to meet 20 cases each, they can use every kind of implant and implant system. So we see a lot of different implant systems with our mm -hmm. students, more than 700s now, oh. uh, that <laughs> if you have a platform switched implant and has a good ceiling in between the apartment and the implant, uh, even you place it a little bit more close to each other, which is not perfect, but especially in the lower jaw in the anterior region, we don't see this bone resorption like you see it uh, in other implant system with the hex. And there's a lot of theory behind and some guessing, but uh, even we don't know the mechanism perfectly, we have the facts. And uh, this gives me some yeah, thinking about that, that uh, this kind of uh, design, which also was published from Duati 2006, uh, gives uh, the soft tissue the option to have, um, let me say, because the fibers are surrounding the implant, it's like a, you know, like a ball attachment and the soft tissue is the ring, uh, which is a little bit more stable. And this is what you mentioned. And uh, especially if you have not always uh, the keratinized mucosa with your nice surgical approach, and this thickening of the soft tissue because of this platform switching and about the concavity of the abutment gives the soft tissue more room and volume and uh, stabilize it in a little bit mechanically in this way. And this can be one of the reasons, but there's a lot of mechanism behind and um, yeah, we can discuss a lot of that, but this is my input to that. But now we handle over to the next question before we go to the cases for the students, what they provide us to discuss too. Uh, Catherine, do you name the next question, please? Uh, Catherine, I, 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 he had I, only, he had another question regarding. PM. Yes, yes. Uh, PM, I, I, okay, uh, Yonis, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you make four questions, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, you're no problem. Yeah, we, we, we make it. We make it. Okay. Yeah, you, you said you can ask questions, not only yeah. one question. Then okay. I'll ask only one. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think. I think um, 
BRF is not a connective tissue. Huh? If you have, if you want to have something that is stable, then you have to use connective tissue because, of course, depending what kind of uh, type of PRF you, you, you use, you can also prepare it in a way that you can pull it uh, like a membrane, but uh, this will fall apart over time. And you don't have, you have a lot of growth factors, uh, a certain mechanical stability, but uh, you need also cells. And I, I, if I uh, have, for example, a case where you have a small recession, maybe two, three millimeters at a natural tooth, and you have still keratinized tissue, maybe two, three millimeters of gingiva, then you can use uh, in a Miller class one, Capilla perfect, you can use probably also PRF. But if you have a challenging case, uh, let's see 10 millimeter, imagine the case with the lower canine that I have had, there for, for sure PRF will not work. PRF would work maybe, or would give some additional benefit if you have a connective tissue and you put also PRF. <laughs> But uh, in very difficult cases, you need connective tissue. Okay. Thank you. Because okay. I, I I have used a lot of PRF and uh, I was not uh, uh, hundred percent satisfied with the with the results. That's why. That's what I, That's what I mean. It's a it's a matter of the case selection, and in impossible cases, or you are if you want really to go for sure, use autogenous tissue, and then of course you can also play with. Endogame with PRF, hyaluronic acid, you can play with these tools as well. But the first is case selection, proper surgical technique, use connective tissue and make a proper uh, proper uh, uh, suture, okay? These are okay. more important than playing with all the uh, kind of centrifuges. But okay, th thank you, yeah. thank you. And uh, my last question was uh, regarding the surface treatment of the exposed oh, yeah. implant. I think that even if, I mean, now I didn't speak about perimplantitis, okay? This is another topic. So this was not the topic of my lecture. But even if I have a recession at an implant surface, I try to, to clean it a little bit. And what we use nowadays is this uh, um, um, erythritol powder, the perioflow, because uh, we don't have better tools, okay? We, because it is very difficult to use a cure. Sometimes we combine it with a, uh, titanium curate, but uh, uh, this perioflow is quite uh, quite okay. And of course, uh, there are also probably a better technique like this Galvano technique that um, we would like to try, because this seems to be um, very 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 good, and you can very predictably remove the biofilm. Because if you have bacteria on an implant surface that is more difficult to clean than a tooth, then of course your your, your outcome is a little bit jeopardized. So that's why I think that uh, um, the first step is to clean it and then you can do whatever you want, but you need also another surgical approach. Okay, uh, so, so mechanical and chemical cleaning. Chemical, what? I don't know. I mean, uh, this Galvano uh, technique, I, I think this you can use, <clears throat> but we use the, uh, the perioflow. And this is, this is of course rather mechanis, me mechanical cleaning because this is not uh, chemical, so we don't use citric acid or, or uh, EDTA whatsoever. So uh, according to literature, it is not a, a big advantage if you use that. So you don't use laser or uh, chlorhexidine? No. Or nothing? No, I mean, you can also play with the laser, but it was also not very successful. We used the Erbiumiag laser, we used also CO2. You can also use diode laser, but if you compare really the studies, and we did some systematic reviews, and you have also data from Frank Schwartz, it's not a big difference. Even if you, you to, uh, take a, a gauze and you play, place it in cell line and you clean it, uh, it was the same result than with chlorhexidine. So I think that uh, you have to remove the biofilm mechanically as good as you can. And the curate is too big to go in the traps. I mean, it's, it's logical. I mean, you cannot remove with such a curate, such a... Uh, Small bacteria, as so, is impossible. So, so you have to use something different. Yeah, that's why the, the chemical is important because reduce the biofilm. If you don't use the uh, reduce the biofilm, so the mechanical cleaning is not effective. I think. No, I mean I don't agree. I think you have to use it with a. Uh, so now, with yeah. flow is not okay. Chemical. Now, now, now we have to interrupt because otherwise okay. it was a personal <laughs> discussion. 
Uh, which was the next name which was has a question to Anton Skulian? We have two more questions. After that, we have to move on to discussion the cases, okay? Yes. Uh, so next question is from Dr. Pasidi, who will actually join the upcoming MOI class. Michael, you have the microphone. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Is that clear? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm very thrilled to listen to the uh, lecture. It was very good and I uh, was amazed to see fixing recession around the implants. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. The first one uh, with the implants, already existing implants with no creatinized mucosa, can we do free gingival graft after the implant have been integrated or is it a lost cause? That's the first question. Um, the second one uh, with fixing recession around implants, does it have to have be a single implant in between teeth? You can't do it on two, uh, joining sorry to adjacent implants yeah thank you so much yeah that's an uh, important question or two important questions i think that um, um, of course in many cases you have already the situation that you don't have fac facially attached uh, mucosa so you have to treat it you cannot remove the implant the implant is also integrated but you have very often these cases in the posterior area so you Mandible, best, yeah, yeah. The, you, the best is to use a free gingival graft, but not to cover the implant surface because this will not be successful, but base ap apically. So you make the first incision. If you still have maybe one band of uh, attached mucosa, you make it a little bit apically and you fix it uh, exactly to the periosteum. Then you need to have a split thickness wrap and you fix it there. So mm -hmm. this is the most predictable approach, okay? Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, to the second uh, question that you have is uh, whether you have recessions at two implants. But then the problem is that if you have these cases, in the majority of the cases, the interproximal papilla is gone or not completely gone, but is at least uh, you don't have the same bone support. So this is the advantage of a tooth. It keeps the, the papilla. Uh, in some cases, you can only thicken. Okay, you cannot predictably cover it, but you can thicken it and you still have an improved outcome. But uh, uh, usually, as I've shown it to you, you have already uh, some loss of the uh, interproximal the bone. The bone is always determining the height of the soft tissue. And the other thing, sorry, quickly, uh, with that tuberosity connective tissue graft, do you have bone transformation from them occasionally? Because I have a couple of cases when it actually transformed into bone later on. Is it possible or it just feels different to touch? That's all it is. No, I mean, uh, this is very good. Not, not only the tuberosity graft, but also the palatal graft sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, especially if you use them as a free ginger graft. Okay, if you mm -hmm. take them together. Um, and we have now a paper in publication we have, where we have harvested the entire bunch of tissue in block. And we did histology and if, of course, it worked like a kind of GBR caps capsule, and we have bone formation mm -hmm. underneath. So uh, okay. it can, but not because of the connective tissue. We don't know the mechanism. Mm -hmm. One possibility would be that uh, what we discussed is that you transplanted also the periosteum with the graft, and the periosteal cells have the potential to create bone, or okay. you place the free gingival graft on the periosteum, then you you somehow you you because you suture it to the periosteum somehow you give a, a kind of impulse to the cells to create bone okay uh, we don't mm -hmm. know what is the proper mechanism but in fact you are right the, it can uh, create bone and we have demonstrated also in a, uh, a three-dimensional image com combim ct showing that the bone is growing uh, around i mean you have the the alveolar bone then you have the periosteum and you have another layer of bone and we did it uh, also um, with the CBCT. Then I harvested the graft and we did block biopsy. So we have radiographic imaging and we have also the, uh, the histology. So uh, uh, you are perfectly right, but we don't know the precise mechanism. The exact mechanism. Mm -hmm. Okay, and on the next question, please. Okay, next question comes from our MOI tutor, Daniel Zad. Daniel? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sturian, for this amazing lecture. I have only one question. 
regarding the the composite filling on the uh, lower teeth on the cervical uh, the cervical filling you uh, i noticed that you removed them before yeah. grafting right so it is like a, it's a standardized approach that you that you follow every time or there is a decision making tree like the zucchelli's one uh, that you that you follow can you just explain that no i mean as a periodontist i don't like to cover restoration so this is my first thought i want to have periodontal health so i know that there are data that have shown that it is possible to cover even a composite filling if you have a recession on a composite filling but we don't have long term data so uh, i don't want to cover a recession and to uh, that has a deep filling you know long filling maybe 5 millimeters imagine if you have a leakage there after 5 or 10 years and you have a very nice coverage so how do you get access there only if you raise a flap so in fact mm. you destroy that what you have done so uh, I always remove the composite fillings, but what you can do is sometimes to, to recontour the, uh, the cement enamel junction with a composite and you polish it, okay? And then you move the flap or the tunnel coronally until maybe you, you cover one millimeter of this, uh, if this polished area. In this way, you can have a kind of compromise, but uh, yeah. not about the entire concavity. So I don't place a complete new filling, okay? Even if I have this concavity on the root surface, it is even better. Because if you have a concavity, this concavity will stabilize your blood clot. And what we, the problem is always because, uh, the con convexity. So mm. if I have a natural concavity, then I'm happy because my connective tissue will stay in a so-called contained time defect. And this can have a much better vascularization. OK, but it's instead of uh, uh, thickening, thickening the the gingiva uh, buckley, you are actually stuffing the the connective tissue right inside the uh, inside uh, the uh, the erosion. Yeah, that's a cavity, not an erosion. Yeah. 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 Where is the problem? Uh, you are not th thickening actually from the facial aesthetics. You are not thickening the 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 gingiva. Oh. I mean. No, I mean you have seen the cases. They are thickening. Yeah. I mean, the, if you place two millimeters of connective tissue in an area where you had the filling, then you have two millimeter of thicker tissue. That is thicker. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Anton, now we have to move to the cases where the students has uh, provided and then we have uh, some questions from the students to these cases and also to the others, of course. Mm. Perhaps you can share the screen again. Yes. It was. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. So. Yeah, here we see. Uh, yeah. yeah. Should I show this? Yes. Should I go back or? No, uh, I'm, I think uh, this is a case where we have very poor uh, situation from the bone. And uh, I think the student want to know, and perhaps uh, he can tell it by, uh, he's is joining the Congress, the, the student? Yes, this case was uh, provided by a Dr. Vin Nguyen. Yeah, perhaps he can ask you. Vin, personally. if you want to uh, say something about the case, you have to turn on the microphone. Should I say something or? or no, yeah, you okay, Ben, go ahead. Hello, yes. The, uh, yeah, this case was uh, referred to me and um, the patient is about uh, 70 years old and uh, he in the, uh, around 20 years ago, he got uh, orthodontic treatment to uh, try to, uh, to erupt his uh, impacted canine. However, the canine was ankylosed and so the surgeon removed the canine and unfortunately uh, the area was infected and so the lateral was also extracted. Uh, uh, two years ago, uh, a team of surgeons tried to, uh, to, to graft the area for implant but the graft failed. So they removed the graft, they do the immediate another graft 
which in turn and uh, uh, failed. So now we, we are left with an area which has the poor uh, vascularized, vascularized because of the graft particle is still residual uh, graft particles. Also, we have a recession on the premolar which lost uh, the meson bone, a soft tissue scar. Now, uh, if you want to do another graph, in this case would be a vertical GBR graft. Uh, I would like to know what is the best, uh, uh, as part of the treatment plan, I want to remove the, uh, the first premolar too because I want to take advantage of the this stone bone for the for the improved uh, blood supply, and so I would like to know uh, what kind of uh, uh, um, incision to optimize the flap closure in this case, because the palatal uh, tissue was thick uh, but also uh, vertically defected, so, and uh, that's my question. But you want to have a vertical augmentation, huh? For, you want to have a vertical augmentation at uh, the, the, lateral, the lateral premolar, uh, the lateral incisor, and the, the canine, huh? I'm missing. Uh, and uh, if we take out the, the, the first premolar, we will have to augment uh, the whole area of the three, uh, you know, the, the, the three teeth for uh, preparing for uh, um, implant placement. But why the... take out the, the first premolar? Pardon me? Why, why, what is the reason to take out the, to remove the first premolar? The bone on the, the, the medial, mesial of the first premolar is also uh, very low. And so if we want to do a vertical augmentation, we would just go maybe around not much comparing to if we use the distal uh, uh, bone, a uh, proximal bone of the, 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 the first premolar, we could help with the vascularization and uh, have, a, have a better um, bridge for the, the bone graft. So I probably here you need, a, I think the technique that I know is the most predictable is the technique that is, has been described by Ish, Ishan Urban, you know, the sausage technique. Uh, where he used a uh, uh, particulated uh, autogenous bone together with um, uh, maybe some uh, natural bone mineral in order, in order to keep the volume. And uh, uh, the, the incision should be a little bit more from a palatal side in order to preserve the keratinized tissue or to push a little bit the keratinized tissue from palatally to, uh, to buccally. Okay, so uh, I, would, I would go for the sausage technique, but maybe there are also some other uh, options like, for example, um, so some uh, colleagues were, were working with distraction of the uh, uh, genesis, or maybe some uh, some th these meshes, uh, these uh, rails meshes that you can use. This is also quite successful. I think this could also be a, a good indication um, uh, because with that you can obtain a very nice uh, vertical in increase uh, in the bone. But uh, the incision should be a little bit more palatally, okay? Because otherwise, uh, you may um, uh, you may lose some of the tissue, some of the keratinous tissue. And since you have also some granulation tissue in this defect, then you can take advantage of this granulation tissue. If you incise a little bit more palatally, you preserve the granulation tissue that you push facially, and in this way, you you preserve even more volume for the buccal flap. Okay. Uh, yeah, I uh, thank you so much uh, because I was thinking of having incision more uh, buccally. My rationale is that if we do it more buccally, we have a flap which is wider and longer on the palatal, which is not mobile. Uh, and then we can use the, 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 the buccal flap. We can uh, have it more uh, increased mobility so we can bring it down. Um, I did not think about uh, the, the lingual flap because now if we do from the palatal uh, incision uh, after the graft, the incision, uh, the, the sutures line would be more palatal 
Is no. there any uh, compromise on that? No, what I mean is not to, not, not to have a buckle flap, but to make the incision more palatally. And then you, of course, you prepare the buckle flap, okay? But the incision, instead of having it crestally, you incise it a little bit more buckly, uh, palatally, sorry. And then you can move the buckle flap even more coronally. Of course, the flap is buckle, it's obvious, but you don't go with the incision on the crest, you make it a little bit more palatally, okay? In this way, you preserve more soft tissue for the buckle flap, of course. You understand what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. okay I, I have to interrupt to go for the next case, but the final question I add for Vin is, uh, what is your final decision, Anton? Do you think to, there's a must to extract uh, first primula that the plan is from Win, or even because of the mesal aspect, there's no bone you see in the combium CT, you can keep it. So in other words, is this kind of situation uh, uh, a danger for the grafting procedure because uh, there's no covering of the of bone on the first molar or think it's worse to keep him because the patient is very young? I, I would keep I would keep the uh, the first premolar definitely, but okay. uh, but uh, this is my philosophy yeah. because I think yeah. that, that the rest is the management of the flap and I think if you if you can prepare also the buckle flap very nicely you of course here you will need also um, vertical releasing incisions that you place a little bit more mesially and distally uh, you can also place the the vertical um, releasing incision at the distal part of the first premolar. And then you go intrasacularly and with the other incision more palatally. The, the issue is the flat management and not to extract another tooth. Okay, uh, sorry, we have to go to Thank the you next so much. Uh, uh, case, which is also delivered from a student. So give us the next slides. This one? Yeah, this I one. think this is the case, yeah, from Federico. Yeah, no. and uh, please uh, go go through uh, because there are many slides, uh, two or three. Yeah, so he plays a uh, implant, okay, and finally he ends up with a situation. Next, please. Sing, uh, next, please. That was the last, I think. Oh, this was this. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and um, so. In the, in the in the first uh, point, he has a recession. So perhaps you can talk uh, to him directly. What his uh, question is about his case to you, mm -hmm. Federico. Federico, you have the microphone. So the the, the issue is the the thin the thin. Uh, hello. hello, can hello. you hear me? Yeah, we yes. can hear you, Federico. Maybe you can give us some background about the case and maybe some difficulties you experienced. Sorry, I can't. Federico, can you hear us? No, it's not working. I think there might be an internet connection problem. If you want to, we can move on to Erling's case because he's also yeah. here. Okay, we go to the next case and perhaps Sorry, you can... Sorry, I'm here again. Ah, oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, maybe it was a problem with the internet connection. Sorry, I can not also turn the video on. I'm having a problem with the camera. Um, sorry, I, what was the question? Uh, can you hear us now? Yes. So we just showed some slides from uh, your patient's case and uh, maybe mm -hmm. you could give some background information to um, the participants and Paul and Professor Skulian as well. Okay, so uh, basically this tooth had a, an horizontal fracture mm -hmm. uh, below the, the gum level and uh, we decided for the extraction and implant with immediate loading. And I think the pictures you showed after were only after the, the, the healing. Oh. We lost him again. This was the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, Frederico, uh, please uh, write it uh, on a chat your your uh, question to uh, Professor Skulian. So, uh, Anton, go to the next case. Otherwise, we lose a lot of time. 
um, and uh, Frederico perhaps can chat it or can make it by WhatsApp and we will do it. So this was a, a case of the Erling Valdemarsen, which is also a lecturer after you. And um, yeah, this was the first uh, yeah, initial situation, but I think he can comment better uh, okay. by his own. Yes, hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This was a traumatic case. Uh, he, he got hit in the face with, uh, with some lumber uh, while working. And uh, he broke the, the crown of, of tooth 2-1. Uh, it was previously uh, restored by some para posts. Uh, and, and there was nothing left of the tooth uh, to, to build on. So we just decided to, uh, to remove it and, and place an immediate implant. Uh, you could uh, show the next slides. So this is the, the clinical pictures of, of the insertion of the implant and the grafting with the xenograft and the x-ray of, of the implant uh, post-operative. I would like to ask you, Skulian, if, if I may, uh, would you graft this with a soft tissue also? Yes, definitely. Because in this way you will uh... Uh, you you will avoid um, also um, the hissons at the at the grafted site. So what the, the issue is in this case, what I would have done before is to maybe to keep the tooth at the, at the beginning to to have a tunnel from canine until the uh, the two uh, tooth number one one or even one two, you know, soft tissue grafting wait for that healing and then to extract the tooth and do what you did. Of course, theoretically, you could also do it at, in the same stage. But I think if you have more soft tissue, you can work ma ma better also with the implant. So uh, if the patient doesn't have, of course, pain and so on, uh, and this, the tooth is, of course, not mobile, then you could do it in, in this way. Otherwise, I would have grafted during the surgery. So you, you do what you did, but you could extend it in a, in a tunnel with a long connective tissue graft, uh, extending from canine to canine even, no? because then you improve the, the overall aesthetic situation and, uh, and then do the same what you did. I think you did right, but uh, I think you have still a lack of soft tissue, you see? Okay. And uh, uh, in these cases, uh, in my opinion, it is mandatory to, to have a long connective tissue tunnel from canine to canine place a graft and then the best would be to do it before, but sometimes it is impossible. Then you do it during the surgery and you did everything right, but a connective tissue graft uh, with a tunnel is missing. And I would use the tunnel technique because if you cut the papilla in this case, it seems to get more difficult to suture and the healing is not that nice. So for these cases, the tunnel is very predictable and very good. And if you use connective tissue, then you won't have big uh, post-operative complications. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, and, and then this is also answering the question. Can you go to the last slide um, pro from this case? Yes, yeah. next one. Yeah, on the right side. So now we have a situation. No, next one. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no problem. I was too fast. Yeah, yeah, as always. <laughs> uh, no, the last one here. On the, this yes, one? this one, yeah, okay. How can I do it? Yeah, okay. So let me say, uh, this uh, patient from Erling is showing up uh, next month to you with this uh, outcome, yeah? And you see now one one is a tooth and uh, two one is an implant crown, implant bone crown, right? Yeah. And uh, then the patient, uh, let me say, is uh, fall in love new and uh, the girlfriend has a problem with this recession. So now you have a recession on the tooth and you have a recession on the implant side by side. Uh, do you use now the same approach? And I think you already mentioned it with this uh, tunnel technique and uh, this grafting or do you this uh, grafting and recession covering on the tooth and the implant in a different way? Uh, mm -hmm. So if this patient show up tomorrow in your, uh, not tomorrow, but on Monday in your office. 
with this uh, kind of uh, um, wish that he want to get out of this recession problems. Maybe you cannot get out perfect 100%, but what I would do is definitely, this is a perfect case for tunneling. So I would do tunnel from uh, first premolar to the other first premolar. So in, in, including the canines and take a huge graft, a long graft and cover everything and move also the tunnel coronally. So in this case, I could definitely improve the situation at the teeth. And if I improve the situation at the teeth, then uh, the implant will also improve because I move okay. everything coronally. So this is really the good case for tunnel, but don't cut the papilla. This is the message, don't cut the papilla use a coronally uh, advanced tunnel with connective tissue graft. And this case will be will turn out very nicely. Maybe not 100% coverage, but even if you obtain in this case 90 or 85 or 80, it is still very good. Okay, yeah, then I, I will uh, close this uh, lecture and the question and answer with two of my questions, which are a little bit provocative, because you have to know and I have to tell all these participants that uh, Tony, as uh, so Professor Anton Scullia, gives me uh, not a promise, but a discussion that he will try to join as a lecturer in our program. And I, I think this will be very, very great, but we will still working on him because he is completely fully scheduled. He has never time, um, but we'll see. But um, to give you a picture, uh, in our classrooms, we always discuss different options, different therapy options like you in your lecture and try to find some literature or we don't find literature like you too, especially in implants. Uh, uh, this is all the reason that we go for this uh, topic that uh, there's a little bit poor, the literature about recession covering on an implant. Um, and uh, the best thing is to avoid recession. So, um, which kind of recommendation you give in your experience and your literature knowledge after you extract the tooth and you have, let me say, some dehiscence of your buccal plate. So most of the clinician and literature uh, recommend you to place some grafting materials in the so-called distance uh, space between implant and the buccal aspect and then put a crown on tip. So we talk about immediate placement and immediate restoration in the aesthetic zone with a single. Or um, is it also, let me say, for you a possible way um, that you do the same, but without grafting material, putting in only the blood clot or some PRF uh, in the so-called jumping distance uh, space was placed. And so I want to have a short uh, opinion on that and which kind of party in the implant community you are the prioritization or you give us uh, some. this was uh, my first question and the second one comes later on now we will discuss on that okay so uh but you mean an immediate implant placement extraction yeah. and immediate implant placement yeah so the the case where we see before because of the internet connection was to go down from erling um, is uh, now from Federico, sorry, from Federico Catalao. Uh, he placed the implant and he placed some bone minerals into the socket and then he placed the temporary restoration of the final one. And this is uh, yeah, one of the approach and the other approach is to do the same but not placing any minerals, only the blood clot uh, will transfer to bone, to native bone. And um, if you remove the temporary restoration, you always see in the soft tissue, this, um, so this, this, this granulas, this granulas, uh, the white granulas in the tissue, in the soft tissue. And I don't get a good feeling if I have a patient comes every five years and say, hey, doctor, there's a problem. There's some white granulas coming out of my gingiva. Yeah, this I have sometimes uh, as an experience. And there we think about uh, perhaps we have can avoid it or of course, you can also look, uh, place some bone chips, uh, uh, native bone chips into this gap. But uh, what is uh, this kind of uh, yeah, recommendation of today from you, from your experience and from your literature knowledge? I, th I think um, that basically um, the idea is always to stabilize the blood clot. So if you use, for example, a um, kind of um, granules, well, let's say BIOS or uh, bios chips or whatever what resolves uh, slowly um, 
I want, I do not aim a GBR, a guided bone regeneration in these cases, because you cannot completely close. So this is not GBR. So the, the, the rationale to use the bone uh, filler is to preserve, first of all, the volume mm -hmm. and to include the space for the blood flow. So in fact, uh, uh, in my rationale, I use the filler to stabilize the blood clot. This is one modality. And I don't like to use the particles. I, what, what to use nowadays is just a simple kind of collagen mixed with the particles. This is a bias collagen, for example, that you can use because the collagen attracts the blood, stabilizes the clot and uh, maintains the volume, okay? And if I am able to, to do this without a filler, but I don't know how to do it. If you find another possibility to do it, I think you have your technique that you have shown a couple of times. Uh, I think that's also fine. Okay. But, uh, but I don't place the, the bone there to get a, 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 to aim bone regeneration. In these phases, you always want to preserve the volume and to stabilize the blood clot. Okay. This is the aim also of the graph. Yeah, I'm, I completely, uh, yeah, in line with you. But uh, we have learned that uh, if you place a crown on top, which is uh, going into this uh, curve of the tooth per arrow um, um, arch, the tooth arch, uh, that the pressure of the lip is not so strong on the alveolar ridge. And we don't get this big uh, con uh, concavity uh, in the alveolar ridge than is described by Mario Sanch uh, in his uh, randomized clinical trial 2017, because he using only a uh, healing uh, abutment on top and therefore the, the lip uh, can pressure a little bit more on the other ridge and then he created this cavity. And we see in our cases, this not so much. So we are also going for doing nothing in it because the stabilization uh, is very nicely because there's not a lot of pressure. Um, but uh, we have to see it also in a, in a study which we are now trying to do with some master thesis, okay? I, I agree with you. I think, um, um, I agree with the biology behind, you know, to, to, to stabilize the blood clot. Mm -hmm. I think this, is, this, is, this is the issue. This is the main issue. And mm -hmm. you can stabilize the blood clot in different ways. Yeah, of course. So then the last question, and then uh, you have to run again in another meeting, you tell me. You're a very busy man. Um, you mentioned in your lecture as one of the reasons uh, for this dehiscences in implants, and we do it also in our school. And we have a lot of discussion because my students know me um, and this is for a long time, uh, that I always uh, recommend the following. You have, have an alveolar ridge and you can place, a, let me say, a 4.5 millimeter implant and you have still the envelope for 1.5 millimeter or 2 millimeter, what you mentioned. Uh, I can also place an implant which has a smaller diameter, let me say 3.8. So um, then you have a thicker envelope. The envelope is perhaps 2.5 millimeter or 3 millimeter because you use a smaller diameter, even you have uh, the possibility to use a wider diameter. So in what is your recommendation? Uh, is the smallest diameter, which is possible, even in the alveolar ridge, which is wide, really a good way for this prevention of dehiscences? Of course, the diameter cannot be too small because of mechanical reasons. It has uh, minimal size that uh, the mechanical fatigue and the fracture is avoided. But uh, I see in my, in my students, if they start the program, they have the rationale, okay, I have a wide alveolar ridge, I can place a wide implant. I have a small alveolar ridge, I can place only a small one. But if I have a wide one, nobody will place a small one, okay? So what is your recommendation on that? It depends also on the implant uh, type that you use, huh? uh, probably, because I mean, usually in burn, we go for uh, reduced uh, diameter implant in frontal area. Okay, yeah, we too. take it uh, 3.3 or I don't know, there are different systems. Uh, and this one we use in the, in the frontal area. However, in the posterior areas, if possible, we don't use the reduced diameter implants. We prefer to go for GBR, uh, and uh, in that those cases we don't use the reduced diameter because we have experience with this 3.3, and uh, this is a little bit uh, uh, too uh, too reduced. But maybe if you have uh, 
3.8, I think is nothing against that. Um, I think uh, the issue is, for me, is where you have uh, the polished surface. Uh, this should be um, supra uh, supramucosal, you know, if you are in the posterior area. I think this is uh, more important than the, uh, the diameter of the implant. Okay. Because of, uh, if you want to avoid complications. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Professor Dr. Anton Skulian, thank you again for your time. Yeah. And thank you again that uh, we have you here in this lecture. Um, I think I learned a lot and uh, my students too, uh, some new aspects, some your philosophy, your knowledge and so on. And I say on behalf of my students and also from the guests uh, coming into this online uh, um, Congress, uh, many thanks. And hopefully we see us personally again as a friend and uh, to discuss on a scientific based way on different aspects. and. Of course, uh, also, it's a little wish for me that you join us as a lecturer in the program too. We will discuss again. And I wish you a nice uh, and uh, good weekend and keep healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Keep thank healthy, you. all of you, and I hope to see you soon. Okay. okay. And uh, thank, uh, you. thank you for the invitation. No, no, we have to thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. So, Catherine, uh, then you can announce uh, how we go on. We have first a break, yes? Yes, we have a short break now. Um, we uh, will cut the break a little. It will be 20 minutes. So we'll proceed at 2.30 with um, the lecture of our MOI graduate, Dr. Erling Waldimarsson. Erling, we are already looking forward to you. Um, but for now, we can all chill for 20 minutes if you yeah, like. Yeah, and stay, stay and stay in the Zoom. Uh, stay, stay in, and uh, uh, yeah, we we come back uh, in 20 minutes. Yeah, stay in the in the Zoom meeting room. Uh, then you don't have to go again in. Right? That's not. That's much more better. Yeah. Exactly. See you later. Okay. <laughs> See you.
All right, Erlen, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, so um, now we see just your presentation. Can you see your presenter's notes? Yeah, I can. Okay, perfect. Should I also have my video of me? Or is that? You, yeah, that would be good. Okay, okay Erling, then um, um, I will go um, to the slide for Paul to introduce you, and then we'll go back to you sharing, okay? Okay. Okay. Hi, Hi. <clears throat> But we'll wait um, three more minutes before we start back with the next session. That's good. Oh, you have the same tie, huh? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so one minute more. I think, uh, Erling, you know, 20 minutes is okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it's about 20 minutes. Yeah, perfect. And we're on perfect timing, Paul. So if yeah, you yeah. like, you can start with introducing our next lecturer. Okay. So, dear guys uh, and participants of this MOI Congress, I hope you are all back in the room, in the virtual room of this online Congress. And um, yeah, it's uh, really nice uh, and an honor for me to introduce you the next speaker. It's Erling Valdimarsson. And he's coming from Denmark, but he has graduated 
2004 or so 16 years ago in Iceland. And um, he working first uh, between 2005 and 12 in Iceland. And then he started his own practice in Denmark, 2012, especially a focus on surgery and implant surgery. And yeah, last but least, you are very proud that you are graduated last year in July with the MOI. And what I read in your CV was that you are now currently run three clinics already in, uh, in southern Denmark uh, with a growing referral yeah, uh, uh, colleagues which refer to you, uh, their patients. And perhaps if you have time in the end of the lecture, you can also talk a little bit if the MOI knowledge uh, will help you to grow in this big size, uh, uh, if you have time. And, but now we are really happy to hear your topic. And uh, you see it also on the screen, the application of allograft versus xenograft bone materials in socket preservation, what we already discussed in the end with uh, Professor Skulian. A volumetric analysis and histological comparison in a split mouse design study, a case series. So, yeah, please start with uh, presenting your master thesis, dear Erling. Thank you very much, Paul. Good. Now we have to share your screen. Just had it here a second ago. No problem. Take your time. We are all relaxed because we are all at home. <laughs> Did you find a share screen at the button? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you do the share screen first. And then portion of a screen. Yes. Yes. And I just have to find the presentation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There it is. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. That's that the first phase is over then. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, dear participants of this online symposium, uh, staff and members of the faculty. Uh, Professor Paul, uh, thanks for this opportunity. I'm honored to be uh, to have the chance to speak here today. As mentioned before, I'm an MOI graduate, finished 2019, and I will be presenting my thesis study. Uh, the, th the name of the thesis study is the application of allograft versus xenograft bone materials uh, in socket preservation, a volumetric analysis and a histologic comparison in a split mouth design study case series. This is a schematic drawing I borrowed from the internet uh, showing the changes to the bone following an extraction of the uh, of a tooth. As dentists, we, we know that the alveolar bone changes after an extraction. This is something we see every day. The physiolo physiological resorption of the bone is evident. There are numerous studies that confirm this, and uh, it has been shown that the uh, resorption can be 30 to 60 percent, or even more in certain cases. Uh, one study states that uh, the extraction of a tooth leads to the loss of bundle bone and resorption and remodeling of the alveolar bone. This in turn affects the bone and tissue volume of the side of the extracted tooth. Another study states uh, socket preservation is observed to work with a variety of bone substitutes. The size of the particles does not seem, have, seem to have any effect on the outcome but uh, studies show that the effect of the procedure varies depending on the materials used. That is why a comparison of uh, biomaterials in circuit preservation is important. 
There are also studies that show that the resorption can be affected by the method of alveolar-rich preservation, or the circuit preservation, so-called. Alveolar-rich preservation results in a significant reduction in the vertical bone dimensional change following a tooth extraction when compared to an unassisted circuit healing. The purpose of my study was to investigate the difference between xenograft and allograft bone materials in socket preservation, covered with a dermal xenograft membrane with the hypothesis that the xenograft would show better results in the volumetric analysis and the allograft would be better in the histology. The design of the study was a split mouth design, comparing both materials in the same individual. And the parameters of the study were measuring the volume changes of the alveolar bone and comparing the histology of the two different bone materials. The hypothesis of this prospective clinical case study was the xenograft will be better in the volume analysis <clears throat> of the bone, but allograft will be better in the new bone formation in the histological samples after five months of healing. Fourteen sockets in five patients were included in the study. The areas were CBCT scanned before the extraction of the teeth and at the time of harvesting the bone biopsies five months later. The measurements were done in the CBCT software and the bone biopsies were processed at the University of Copenhagen. The following slides show one of the participating patients in the study from start to finish. This x-ray shows teeth 1.6 and 1.7, which were deemed unrestorable. This is the slide shows uh, the area uh, immediately after extraction of the teeth. And here we have the immediately after, after the, the socket preservation, sockets 1 and 1.7 and 1.6. The area of, of 1.6 is grafted with allograft, and the area of 1.7 is grafted with xenograft. This slide shows the four x-rays from start to finish. The fourth one was taken at the time of harvesting the biopsies at five months. This clinical picture shows the finished socket preservation of the area with a dermal xenograft membrane covering the sockets sutured underneath the gingival margin with a 5-0 suture. And I want you to notice the, the alveolar uh, contour of the buccal bone in the, uh, around the alveolar. This is at two weeks post-op, the time of suture removal. The picture shows a partial covering of soft tissue over the grafted areas and some exposed grafting particles. At this time, we have a similar volume of both sockets. This picture is taken three months after the operation and shows some xenograft particles still being rejected, but no infection or symptoms, just particles that are not integrated. And here we have the picture of, at the time of uh, the harvesting the biopsies, at five months, and notice the soft tissue and the volume of the areas of teeth 1.7 compared to 1.6. It's clear that there has been more resorption in the allograft treated socket. When placing the pictures in a row, the volume change is very clear and showing more dimensional change in the allograft treated circuit of tooth 
This clinical photograph shows the healed socket at the time of harvesting the bone biopsies and placing the implants. Clinically, it's clear that the structure of the new bone was very different. The allografted site of tooth 1-6 was much more like native bone compared to the xenograft treated socket of 1-7. Here you also can see that some particles of, of the xenograft still uh, very loose in the surface of, of the har uh, harvested area here. This picture shows the, one of the biopsies and the trephine drill I used for harvesting the biopsies. And this is a picture of the implants in place. Clinically, there was great difference in the bone quality when placing the implants, where the xenograft treated circuit had a very loose consistency and low primary stability of the placed implant compared to the allograft treated circuit, which had very similar quality as native bone. And the last clinical picture of this case is uh, of the restored implants and the neighboring teeth, but also shows clearly the difference in the volume shrinkage of the two areas. The measurements for the study were done on CBCT scans. This is a screenshot of, uh, of uh, socket, socket 1-6, the allograft treated socket. Uh, a total of seven xenograft sockets were measured and seven allograft sockets were measured. Measurements were done on the height of the socket, the mesiodistal width of the sockets, and the buccolingual dimension at the most surgical part of the alveolar bone. This slide is of the same area without the measurements showing the allograft treated socket of 1.6. And here we have a slide of the xenograft treated socket of 1.7 without measurements. And this is with measurements. Negative dimensional changes occurred at all 14 sockets. The sockets grafted in the maxilla showed most dimensional change and the posterior mandible sockets showed least change, as has been described in the literature. The thick cortical bone in the mandible or molar area resorbs much slower than the thin cortical bone in the maxilla. The mean negative volume change of the xenograft sockets in the buccolingual dimension was 1.25 millimeters versus the negative mean volume of change of the allograft socket was 2.83 millimeters, a difference of 44%. That indicates that the allograft material has a fast turnover and resorbs more easily than the xenograft material. The biopsy was then sent for histological assessment at the University of Copenhagen at the Panum Institute for histology analysis. The biopsies were placed in 10% buffered formalin and decalcified in a solution containing 3.3% formaldehyde and 17% formic acid for two weeks. The tissues were embedded in paraffin wax blocks and then tissue sections of four to five micrometers were stained by hematoxylin and eosin. This is a table of the histological findings. In the table, it's clear that there is an inflammatory response with the presence of neutrophils, mononuclear cells, and macrophages. In the majority of the samples, no osteoclasts were found. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Mononuclear cells and macrophages in the majority of the samples, no osteoclots were found in the biopsies, but activated osteoblasts were found in all samples except, except one, showing a clear picture of new bone formation. All the samples showed more than 90% vital bone, meaning that 90% of the autologous bone within the sample 
was vital. Vital bone was interlocking the bone particles and some fibrous connective tissue was found between some of the bone particles in two of 12 samples. And connective tissue was found at the edge of the biopsies as correlates with the clinical finding of less integration of the graft material at the junction of the bone and soft tissue. This is a slide that shows the tissue section of the biopsy from the xenograft uh, treated socket after staining with hemotoxylin and eosin, showing native bone around xenograft particles. Red arrow is the, uh, the xenograft and the blue is, is the native bone. This slide shows a tissue section of the of a allograft treated circuit. And in this slide, osteoblasts are aligned between the native bone and the grafting, grafting particles showing an area of bone formation. This slide shows a tissue section of a xenograft treated circuit where xenograft bone particles are interlocked in native bone and also inside connective tissue. This is another xenograft slide. Connective tissue was found at the edge of the biopsies as correlates with the clinical finding of less integration of the graft material at the junction of the bone and tissue. As conclusion for the histological examination, there was uh, no difference between xenograft and the allograft biopsies regarding new bone formation and viable bone. Both materials showed equal amount of living bone and osteoblast activity, indicating that both materials are of equal biocompatibility and testifying that both materials can function when used in GPR treatments. It can be assumed from the findings, although there are many limitations to the study, that the use of alveolar ridge preservation with both xenograft and allograft material after an extraction of a tooth is a preventive bone resorptive treatment when implant supported restoration is planned. The mean volume difference was less in the xenograft treated circuit compared to the allograft treated circuit indicating a higher volume loss of the allograft treated circuits. This may reflect the higher turnover of the allograft material and the time interval from the augmentation until the sampling of the biopsies, which may have been too long for the allograft material and too short for the xenograft material. This was not reflected by the histology analysis which did not show any significant difference between the allograft samples and the xenograft samples. Clinically, the xenograft material was more loose than the allograft and the allograft more compact when placing the implants and easier to achieve a better primary stability in the allograft treated circuits. The histology showed no significant difference in the viable cells and bone formation, thus giving reason to believe that non-resorbable xenograft particles need longer time to become interlocked in the newly formed bone, and that five months is too early for the reopening of the xenograft treated circuits. Both biomaterials tested in this study were osteoconductive and had biocompatibility at the cellular level to an equal degree the amount of resorption of the two materials differed and the xenograft showed better results in the volume tests. The results are inconclusive, but interesting and should be researched in a similar bigger scale clinical trial. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Erling, for this very interesting approach and results, even with histological uh, proof. Um, yeah. So I think, Catherine, um, there are any kind of questions listed? Um, at the moment, we have no questions in the chat. You may also wave to me if you have your camera on. 
Ah, Vin has a question. So, okay. Vin, I gave you the microphone. Hello. Perfect. Yes, hi. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I have a question regarding er er Erling's uh, study. The first question, uh, two questions actually. The first question is it, uh, is there a possibility of having an effect on when the two graph sockets was placed close together? In drug uh, study, we can say that it's like a flow over effect or something like that. If one drug can affect the other drug in the same mouth. In your case here, could it be possible that there's a mechanical effect by one, when placing one graph next to another graph, comparing to let's say one graph versus an empty socket uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of volume of the, of the rich? The second uh, question is that uh, the study have showed that different biomaterial has different uh, length of, hell, uh, of healing. Let's like say a xenograph, some uh, we have to wait nine months and uh, allograph six months. Now, if after five months, if the particle is not completely settled, is it is there any effect on the the rich uh, final rich uh, dimension if uh, the particle is not uh, uh, completely uh, solidified or, or, or mature thank you can you hear me yes yes, yes. yes okay thank you for the question good questions uh, I believe so that if you if you leave a if you graft one socket with uh, biomaterial and you leave a socket next to it empty, you probably will get more resorption uh, around the the grafted socket also. That uh, that's that's my thoughts about uh, the the question you asked. Uh, in this case, I have two sockets. I graft them both, so I I, I have a limited uh, resorption of of both sockets. Um, regarding the, the, the other question, which was, uh, can you re repeat it, please? I remember the question. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the timing of the... the yeah, yeah the, ridge, the, the width of the ridge and, and, and the timing of, of, of reopening. And yeah, I, I think the, the, the grafted particles, the, the, there will be some remodeling of, of still going on with the xenograft uh, for longer period of time, uh, but still lot, much less resorption of, of, of those sockets than, than uh, uh, allograft sockets. So I, I, I would, I would uh, think that uh, you can, you can get a relatively stable outcome with the xenograft uh, for a longer period of time than compared. Thank you. All right. Uh, more questions? Um, in the chat, um, there's just congratulations on a great lecture, but no. Yeah, yeah you, get, you get a lot of congratulation. Uh, yeah, you can be proud of. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's very clear and it's an amazing study. So I have to add one question, and this is mostly if you be on stage or even on online, you be on stage. Uh, you invested now two kind of materials with different properties, and you find very nice uh, results. But in the end, there is a question. Yeah. If a patient is coming to your office, or you get a referral, or your own father is in the dental chair, yeah, and you have this kind of uh, initial situation that you have to extract the tooth and you don't want to lose too much bone and uh, yeah, soft tissue. Um, I think you, you, you go in a dilemma because uh, um, with one of the material, you don't get a good primal stability. With the other one, uh, you lose more volume. Yeah? So how you solve this dilemma? So what is your recommendation to all these participants? If this kind of situation comes on Monday uh, to your one of your three offices, yeah, 
That's a good question, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, if, if, if you're going for a stable result, I would go for the xenograft and I would go for nine months, for healing of nine months. But it's not often that you, you, you can wait nine months for, for a treatment. Mm -hmm. in, in, in times today, we want to finish the, the cases fast and the, the patient wants it. So, actually, I, I don't use circuit preservation very much in, in my practice. I, I use it seldomly, uh, but when I do, I, I use xenograft particles. Mm -hmm. And I wait very long, I wait nine months. Joe, uh, yeah, sorry, my next question is, uh, what do you use uh, instead of socket preservation? Yeah, I, I do very much uh, immediate implants. Ah, good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy. Yeah. yeah, because this is one what we have also communicate to you, if it's possible, of course. Yeah. Uh, this is a better way because the uh, patient has not to wait nine months for the tooth in the gap. Uh, mm -hmm. They can go home <laughs> mostly with a tooth or with a, yeah, okay. But uh, meanwhile, we got some other questions. But uh, let me tell once, yeah, you've seen, uh, we have not a professional lecturer now, if you have an MOI graduate, like Anton Skulian, he can handle very nicely five questions from Yonis and he write down. So please, only one question, one answer, then one question, one answer, even uh, from the same, because uh, this is a little bit more convenient for the lecturer because the lecturer is always nervous like me too. I'm nervous too. So, Katrin, can we have one or two questions more? Yes. I have still next. time, some minutes, yeah. Mm -hmm. The next question is from Felipe. Yeah. Felipe, are you there? Uh, Felipe actually wrote his question in a chat because his audio is not so good. Uh, he said, in the end, what is your clinical choice of biomaterial? Yeah, this is the same. What, uh, yeah, that's actually, we answered it. We just, just answered before. it. Yeah. yeah. But, okay. uh, yeah. So then we have the next question from Daniel. Daniel Zad. Uh, it's coming. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yes, I just was wondering if uh, we mix up the two materials in one socket, if uh, maybe we got uh, more mm -hmm. stable or better result. I don't know. Yeah, I think you would probably get uh, a more fixed, uh, stable uh, result of, of the material faster than just clear mm -hmm. or, or, or pure xenograph material. Yeah. Thank you. All right, and now we have another question um, from Wong Chin Mi. I can also read it out loud. He also posted in the chat. Uh, he's asking, now there is a more convenient socket preservation material, Ossix bone, which is worth exploring. It's a company from Israel. And now that I'm reading it, it's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's fact. <laughs> it's not a question, okay. Um, <laughs> So, Wong, um, I gave you the microphone. If you have another question, you may also ask it. No, maybe he works with us, Expo. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> okay. Um, no, then in the chat, rest of the people say congratulations again, Thank but you. no other questions. Okay, then, uh, then I think we close this kind of question and answer for your lecture. Once again, thank you for your time, for your effort that you present our, your results here to this uh, MOI family and this Congress. And uh, yeah, uh, I hope uh, you will be very successful in future to open more and more offices. So you infiltrated the whole Denmark population <laughs> with your offices. And uh, yeah, I hope we see us personally soon. Early, yes, yeah? thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So now uh, we come to the next lecturer. I think uh, all of us uh, which are going for these alumni meetings and so know him. It's uh, Dr. Wingai Bnungien, and he is graduating in Montreal 1987. So two years earlier than me. So he's really a very experienced one. And six years ago, 2014, he uh, finalized his uh, study here in the MOI program with his master thesis. 
And uh, since six years, um, he's really pushing us and giving a good ambassador job. And he's also a tutor. So this is a dream of every uh, program director to have this kind of ambassadors, not stopping doing research after they finish the master thesis, they're going on and also going on for lecturing. And um, I push always my students also to invent something if they have an idea and doing uh, this very long and difficult way to realize it. And he realized one of his invention, this is called the periostal inhibition technique for ridge preservation and immediate placement. Uh, he already published it in a very nice ranked uh, paper. And he is also the founder director of the Montreal Society of Implantology, uh, meaning that he is also organizing a very, very nice uh, alumni congress uh, uh, last year in, um, in Canada. So his topic is uh, presenting updates to his research. Uh, his um, yeah, topic now is inhibit this, whatever it means. <laughs> application of the PI technique in complex dental rehabilitation. Please win, uh, the stage is now for you, the virtual stage. So please share your screen. And um, yeah, we are really eager to hear about your new insights and experience and results for your great uh, inhibition, peri periostal inhibition technique for rich preservation. Okay, so. You have to find also your, yes, your and you presentation. See? Yeah, yeah, we see it perfectly. Looks great. The yes. the first slide uh -huh. is already on the screen. So please, and also 20 minutes also for you. Please I try to a, keep this yes, time. This time I will try. <laughs> okay. I, first of all, I thank you Paul so much for, for letting me, uh, allow me to, to speak uh, in front of a uh, Congress. And uh, congratulations and thank you for this uh, MOI staff for organizing uh, 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 the, uh, this traditional meeting, even uh, during our difficult time. So uh, today topic I will, it's not um, a study or anything, it's just a few a clinical case update to the PI technique. And um, uh, it will be, uh, clinical applications of the periosteal inhibition technique in complex cases. Uh, but uh, first of all, I would like to explain briefly how the socket preservation techniques uh, uh, works for those who are not familiar with this. So uh, P, uh, PI is a socket preservation technique aiming for uh, on preserving the buccal bone plate while allowing the socket to heal naturally uh, without any bone graft. In this technique, a high density membrane uh, is inserted between the bone and the periosteal and um, placed for four months during the formation of the bone, host bone within the socket. And uh, a, a gel, uh, uh, gelatin gel, uh, gelatin form, of sponge was pla uh, is placed inside the socket just for it stabilize the blood clot. Um, the advantage of this technique is that it allow natural bone formation within the socket and not grafted bone. Often we don't need a soft tissue graft either because if the, the original position of the gingiva is not modified. And this is uh, the rich dimension at four months both of. And with this technique is typically, we can see the intact buccal bone, uh, cortical bone forming 90 degree angle with the uh, occlusal surface bone. And in, uh, this is a x-ray after four months, we see a, a sharp corner forming by the two surfaces of the buccal bone and the occlusal bone. Uh, it just may be an indication that the buccal bone plate is remained intact. 
So uh, many people asked, uh, why did I come up with this question, uh, this, uh, this uh, idea? Uh, this come from this study, reading this study by uh, Araujo in 2005 and a longitudinal, uh, long, longitudinal, uh, sorry, longitudinal the historic, historic data show that pre uh, the presence of the high number of osteoclasts concentrated on the outer surface of the extraction socket uh, during the healing. And we don't know the reason why there is a accumulation of, of the osteoclast, but the, these bones are resolving the buccone, uh, the buccone and the lingual rate, uh, plate with a very high rate from the early healing of the socket until many months after uh, the formation of bone. The result of the lost bone place is more significant on the palatal, uh, on the buccal aspects. The majority of the socket preservation deal with the intra socket grafting as presented by uh, Erling, the, uh, earlier. And no one has mentioned how to prevent the activity of the osteoclast on the outer bone wall. So what do we know about these cells, osteoclast? This is a, biology, a bone biology model, and we will focus on this area of the bone resorbing phase. When there is a signal such as a damage from a signal of damage from the periodontal ligament in an uh, in example in an extract, extraction socket, uh, uh, undifferentiated monocytes migrate from the blood vessel of the periosteum to differentiate into the preosteoclasts. And only after these cells landed on the surface of the bone that they will communicate, uh, they, com they will migrate toward each other to form a multinucleated osteoclast to initiate a, a resolving phase. And the size of the precursor is nine microns in diameter. So my theory is that if we place a PTFE membrane with a, a 0.3 micron pores. We will prevent these cells from reaching the bone surface to become osteoclasts. And while the membrane allow any nutrition to pass through the to nourish the bone. And so uh, our pilot study on periosteal inhibition technique was published last year in the Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry. And so uh, somebody interested in a uh, 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 full text of this, please email me. As with the majority of socket preservation techniques, PI technique can be used as a socket preservation for delay implant placement, or it can be used for immediate implant placement. I will now present the application of this technique in two complex cases, which, are, which, is, uh, which were completed more than two years ago. The first case is uh, this case here, a 42 year old patient with a failed retained canine on the left side due to infection. The canine's prominence in, in this case is usually very difficult to preserve because we lose the buccal bone rapidly after the extraction. And as we see here on the, on the, on the implant on the right side, the canine implant. So the treatment plant here should man be maintaining the contour of the canine as much as possible for aesthetic. So to make the matter worse, the permanent canines are impacted horizontally under the floor of the nose. The left impacted canine can in, uh, interfere with the implant's placement.
So we see here uh, apical erosion of the 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 cortical plates by the uh, by the, the the apical abscess, which the leave with the thin uh, band of uh, marginal bone. And I have a choice here to, to, to use a short implant, or uh, we can use a longer implant using uh, go through the canine for uh, me mechanical retention. But doing, by doing that, we have to go through a large um, follicle space, which I'm not very uh, uh, confident. So I decided to remove the implant, uh, the impacted canine and place the immediate implant with the periosteal inhibition technique to preserve the, buccum, uh, the thin buccal band of bone. And so this is uh, the, um, the fla uh, palatal flap was raised and the canine was exposed and uh, sectioned and removed. And uh, this is an empty space that le was uh, left by the, uh, after the extraction. The immediate implant of three millimeter um, and a half uh, diameter was placed with the empty buccal space at around three millimeter. Uh, a gel form was placed in the socket just to stabilize the cloth. Uh, no bone graft, of course, a membrane was placed between the bone and the buccal flap uh, under the periosteal and, uh, and the and suture. You can see here the, the suture that hold the membrane in place. This is uh, after four months, I put a larger healing abutment. The contour is seem to be okay. And this is at the time of uh, final impression. At this time, we remove the membrane by a small incision in the vestibule and just pull the membrane out that way. And this is uh, the result. Uh, this is a final crown after two years after the installation. So we have obtained a proper rich contour, and this was done with no bone graft, no soft tissue graft. I will present the second case. The patient is 22 years old. She wore partial dentures for many years. And when the teeth in the upper left uh, uh, quadrant failed, a periodontist removed the teeth and did rich preservation. She came to see me because the previous team could not give her a definite uh, treatment plan for the right side of her mouth. And we present this treatment with the lower right quadrant. This is a premolar area. Uh, it, was, it has a mobility and recession with poor crown and root ratio, ratio so I decided to include that in the treatment plan. Uh, also, this implant is, is uh, in the plan here is necessary to use as a abutment for the three unit bridge because the, 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 the mental nerve proximity on the second premolar is, is, uh, is very, very, uh, uh, very close to the surface. This is a uh, second premolar and you see that uh, there's no, it's not a good idea to put an uh, implant in this area here. And this is uh, the molar area. We have very short uh, uh, bone uh, height. In this case, you can put a, in, uh, a, sm a shorter implant here, but I don't feel comfortable to put uh, a short implant to support a three, three unit bridge in this case. So we have the situation is that the advanced vertical bone loss with minimum attached soft tissue. Vertical GBR was planned 
with non-resorbable membrane. An option here was to remove the first premolar to feel the socket with graft material at the same time as the posterior, the posterior GBR. But that, by doing so, I would not have been able to preserve the thin buccal bone plate. And uh, I hope doing that, I often had to do additional bone graft. So in this case, I did a temporary partial extraction while waiting for the GBR graft to heal. The crown of the tooth was sectioned just a bit apical to the, to the gingival margin. A denting screw was used to support the PTFE membrane so that the graft particle doesn't, go, doesn't migrate miserably near the nerve exit right here. A flap. We do a flap mobilization. And this is the graft. You notice that there is no bone graft buckled to the to the the pre uh, the first premolar, and no uh, the membrane was cut far away from the uh, five millimeter away from the axis of the mental nerve. And this is uh, x ray uh, af immediately after the the graft. This is after nine months post-op. I had to do a soft tissue graft uh, to augment, uh, to, uh, to uh, increase the keratinized tissue in this case. And this is uh, the, gra uh, the area is ready for the membrane removal and uh, in, uh, implant placement. At this time, we removed the first premolar root. Uh, we, we obtain decent uh, width of rich, rich width and height. You notice a very paper, it's a paper thin buckle plate on the premolar. I decided to do a periosteal inhibition technique here. Uh, two implants was placed. 4.1 millimeter in diameter. The buckle, uh, the empty space was filled with blood cloth alone and a periosteal peri uh, PTFE membrane was placed on the buckle bone between the uh, bone and the periosteal. And this is uh, after four months. You notice that the soft tissue on the premolar done by periosteal inhibition technique was a lot higher than the soft tissue thickness on the, on the molar. And we place a meso structure for a screw retained bridge. And this is the final case. With X-ray, and this is a X-ray that recently play, uh, taken two years after the the installation of the bridge. So, in conclusion, that uh, with proper planning, the PI technique may be a good option to be used in a variety of more complex situation involved in immediate placement. Uh, however, keep in mind that the further evidence is needed for this technique to be applied in a routine clinical practice. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, win great. Absolutely, exactly in time. Uh, and thank you for your cases showing um, our participants. And yeah, Catherine, do we have questions? I think so. Um, yes, we have a question in the chat from Felipe. Felipe, you have to take the microphone. Because I tried to give it to you, but you still have to say yes. Ah, Felipe says he can't, so there's like a technical problem. 
Um, but you can post your question in the chat. I see it. Um, Felipe is asking, um, why did you not make a provisional on the first case, the kind of, the K9 one? Provision, uh, provisional uh, temporary restoration, yes. Yes. Uh, I may be able, would be able to do it, but except that is uh, the palatal surgery was uh, very extensive. And uh, there is, uh, I, uh, I did not uh, try to expose my patient to another like ha an hour to do the temporary restoration in that case. I would just like to close it and, and uh, so the whole surgery is around like uh, two hours, but uh, that's it, that's it's just, a, that's just a, a personal reason. We have enough stability to do an uh, attempt to, the patient is not uh, really interested uh, to have it immediate uh, provisional right away. I understand uh, it's, it would be good to do an immediate provisional right away. But in this case, because of time constraining. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, then the next question is from our tutor, Dr. Jonas. You can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's really a nice lecture. But in the first case, you, you did show us uh, uh, in the molar, you placed the collagen plate, and then you made re entry and you remove the plate. Uh, why, why you do that? Why don't you keep the plate inside if it's collagen plate and then you make re-entry and then you might have a recession again? Would you repeat that? It's the first case, the okay, uh, impaction of the K9, the second K has uh, the molar. No, no, the, uh, yeah, yeah. The, in the molar, you place the collagen plate buccally, right? Collagen plate. What, what, what kind is of plates? Or I know kind of plate you placed. You placed a, a material buccally from the buccal side to maintain the buccal wall, right? Uh, not on the molar, only on the premolar. In the premolar, so it was yes, premolar. Pre yes. And, so what what kind of material is this plate? Ah, you're not familiar with the PAI technique. No, no, I'm not. Yeah. Um, the PI technique. Nick, like I said before, as an introduction, you, uh, it, it's a membrane, it's a PTFE, a high density PTFE membrane. We place it against a buccal uh, bone plate under the period still. This reason is to inhibit the, for, uh, the, 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 the migration of a precursor, osteoclast precursor to migrate onto the bone surface because only when they touch the bone surface, they, they fuse together to become osteoclast that is my uh, my theory is that when we we make a screen we block that and there's no osteoclast formation on the buccal bone so i observed that by doing that the buccal bone is pretty well preserved as you see in this case the very paper thin buccal bone and uh, we just observed by the volume because i did not take the ctb cbct in in canada it's not just you cannot just take cbct just to verify anything but uh, it's it it preserved pretty well. Okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, do you think that you can find another material which we can keep it inside than then then to make re-entry again? Up to now, uh, resorbable membrane because uh, resorbable membrane. If you can find a resorbable membrane that can last for four months, because four months uh, is uh, the the time that needed for the bone. A natural bond of, to be mature inside the sockets. Now, uh, I have the, the impression that at that time, the signal is very slow uh, for the, the, the resorption of osteoclast. Um, up to now, I have tried many different membrane and none of them works except the, the, the PTFI. Because the membrane, also resorbable membrane, uh, the pore is, is, is too big. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, there's another question in the chat. Um, it's from our MOI student, Thomas Streikos. Thomas. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you 
uh, for the great lecture. Uh, I would like to ask uh, about the last case. Uh, dear doctor, could you explain about the abutments? Are these uh, multi-units? And do you use uh, these for small bridges? Uh, could you explain more, please? Yeah, Thomas, why are you moving around? <laughs> uh, I'm standing. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, this is uh, Strawman's like uh, version of a multi-unit abutment. I just want to use that uh, when I have a bridge, it just eliminate the, 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 the possibility, uh, just to have a, a passive fit in, in, in a, to make a screw retain bridge. Uh, the disadvantage of that is sometimes I choose the, the more slender uh, immersion uh, angle, and so it is higher than the changeable contour. So I use it in posterior because you can see it's a, it has a bit of a dark uh, area shining through. Uh, is that the answer? Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. So, is it safe to use it uh, for one side bridges like that? Uh, don't the smaller screws break or something? Uh, this this should be done when you feel that uh, it, uh, you have a larger span bridge uh, or you uh, shorter bridge but with uh, uh, that you're not sure that you have enough uh, you provide enough parallelism. This is just to make sure, it's just a multi-unit abutment uh, to make sure that you have passive fits. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so in the chat, there's no other questions right now. So Paul, I would give the next, no, now there is a question right this moment. Um, yeah. So the next question is from Dr. Moen Shirasi. I gave you the microphone. Yes, looks good. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. We can hear you. Okay. I would like to thank you for your nice case presentations. They were actually very useful for me. Do you hear my voice? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, as a prosthodontist, uh, I always encounter two problems uh, of uh, posterior bone deficiency in height. And I'm sometimes, uh, or I am obliged to change the treatment plan to use uh, removable prosthetes, uh, for example, implant supported uh, over dentures instead of fixed prosthetics. And I would like to ask you that how much bone uh, do you anticipate we can gain through this technique that you presented in the second case? How much bone in height? Yeah, uh, can this be gain. Is, yeah, this uh, the the bone graph is not part uh, is not a major part of my presentation uh, because it's, we for, we try to to introduce a technique on the premolar with this osteo uh, periosteal inhibition with a membrane. The posterior area, uh, I uh, I use it like a vertical augmentation a technique uh, that I I, uh, I learn a bit from everybody, including. Uh, Dr. Isvan Urban. So uh, usually um, in this case here, actually uh, it, it's about five millimeters of, of augmentation. It looks like significant comparing to the beginning, but it's uh, with the, the height and with additional bone, uh, bone width, uh, we have enough uh, bone volume to put implants there. Uh, it's, a, it's a very stable technique, it's very good, uh, it's, uh, it's documented, and uh, I, I have good, good success with, with this technique. Okay, I want to know that uh, how much bone in height when a patient has, you say that it's impossible to uh, put a fixture here. And what is the minimum bone height that you risk to take this operation? Uh, what uh, anybody have an opinion? I I I heard in uh, some uh, some report that they can go to like uh, even ten millimeter with Doctor uh, Urban. Um, because that's a determining factor in prosthetic 
treatment planning. Mm -hmm. We can, we sometimes are obliged to change the treatment plan to a removable one. Definitely. Because of the yeah. posterior lack of bone height. We have a lot of options. And uh, in the case that if you have a mental nerve, uh, the mandibular nerve that's really close, like two, three, four millimeter, usually I have to consider like, a, you know, uh, uh, all on four or something more anterior, uh, utilize more anterior um, as any kind of a treatment plan and treatment uh, uh, technique. You have risk that you have to consider. So it's basically a case to case basis. You cannot just say, okay, automatically you have that bone. You can you can augment 10, 15 millimeter of bone. I have not done a case that I go to 15 millimeter of bones. You know, and 10 millimeter of bone is really a rare case, actually, in, in my, in my, uh, under my hands. But five, six millimeters, we can do quite a lot. And uh, plus the residual bone, let's say, like in this case, about seven, eight millimeter, I, I think that's uh, sufficient to put implants there. Yeah, it's just case by case. And I'm not an expert in, uh, in uh, vertical augmentation, so, that you, we have to, you know. Thank you. Thank you for your response and your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So last question for Win comes from Dr. Weigel, actually. Paul. Hi, Win. Uh, thank you again for these nice cases. Uh, if you, uh, the second uh, case is very challenging and we have also discussed uh, if it's necessary to extract the premolar, but I was really astonished uh, about the result. However, what is your experience? If you have, let me say, 10 this kinds of cases, 10, and you place 10 times these screws for the tainting and place the PF uh, membrane, um, how often you will get some dehiscences? Because uh, if you have a dehiscences of this membrane, I think uh, this will uh, challenging also your results and perhaps uh, sacrifice the results. So what is your experience in these complex cases that you have a DS sense and what is your, your doing if you have this kind of uh, situation? But make it short because we are running out of time. Yeah, the hition is, is reported like as high as 30 something percent. So the hition in, in this kind of, uh, uh, in PTFE membrane is very often encountered. In my practice, it's like about maybe 15% if, because the, the flat mobility is an, a, a very important uh, and, and suture, a very important uh, determination factor. However, dehesion is, is, happens, and I don't worry about that. If I see the dehesion, I will, I will maintain it. I, it's not a, usually it's, it's a small dehesion, and then it it's gets larger with time. And then uh, plaque accumulate on the membrane and the, the, it just push everything around. However, this membrane, a high density membrane has ability to, to, guide, to, to prevent the bacteria, which is very large from entry to the spore. So in okay. this case, uh, yeah, I can leave it until I find that it's really exposed. And I tr it's usually I wait it for nine months, but if it's four months, I can just remove it or even three months and then just close uh, and just let some time the, the, the even like exposed area, the nearest area to heal itself. I just close the, the flap and, and, and because usually under the membrane after three, three weeks already we have like soft tissue healing. And so it's just the membrane to stabilize the bone graft under, we might lose it. You have, sometimes you have infection that have very locally affected the area, but not you. I don't usually see the home graph uh, that I have to read. Okay, mm -hmm. so thank you again uh, for your time. Um, and now, Catherine, I think we have the last short break, right? Yes, we will have a last short break, about 10 minutes. So we meet each other again at 15.45 German time to hear our last lecturer, which will be our tutor, Daniel Zad. So everybody, as always, you may stay in this room and we see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Vin. Thank you, thank you for your attention.
Catherine, give me the sign if we can start. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not sure if um, Daniel is already back. I think we wait another minute more. I'm actually not sure if Daniel is having some technical problems because the system just told me Daniel will start his video later. Mm. So I think we wait another moment more. Yeah, because perhaps you can phone him. What's going on? You have a yeah. phone number. I, uh, I think I have one. Uh, let me look. Yeah, you do. He entered the room a few minutes ago, but now he's not, he's not there. No, he was there a second ago, but I think he lost connection. Okay. There he is. Yes, he's back. He's back? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Daniel, we can see you. Daniel, your microphone is off. I think he connected from his phone. Okay, yeah, no, now no. we can see and hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so. <laughs> so Daniel, you are ready to go? Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, give me uh, some minutes or introduct, introduce you. Yeah. So you're the last speaker of this online Congress. Thank you very much for your effort and your time. Um, Dr. Daniel Saad uh, obtained his degree of doctor of dental surgery in 2006. So 14 years ago from St. Joseph University in Beirut in Lebanon. And uh, 2009, he completed his two year residence programs in France, where he learned also about uh, laser treatment. And of course, three years ago, he's graduated with our Master of Science in Oral Implantology from the Goethe University. And uh, still also like Wynne, he is supporting us a lot uh, as an ambassador and also as a tutor. He holds a private office in Beirut, Lebanon. And of course, he has a special interest uh, in guided surgery. So Daniel, we, we hope uh, that the blast we all shocked in Beirut uh, in the Haber is not affecting your home and your relatives your family and of course also not your private office um, so I will looking forward for your presenting the digital planning and implant dentistry about a case so we're looking forward to see your case and discuss it with uh, the rest of the participants okay Okay, thank you, Dr. Weigel, for giving me this uh, time slot. Uh, I have to share my screen now. Yes. Is it okay? You can see it. Yes, it's very nice. Perfect. Okay, uh, so just some uh, some minutes about or seconds about uh, the blast. Uh, you remember we went uh, once, Dr. Weigel and uh, Katrin. Uh, to take a, uh, a drink on a rooftop, if you remember. So mm -hmm. this was somewhere here, okay? And the blast is here. It's like less than one kilometer. So uh, all the street is demolished. There is no pubs and no restaurants anymore in the street. It's, it looks like uh, something like that. And we were, uh, we were being, being drinking some, having some drinks here somewhere on uh, one of these uh, buildings. So yes, this was a very big blast and we are still under shock. But uh, thanks God, uh, our families and uh, businesses and homes are, uh, are okay. Uh, now, uh, it will not be, the lecture will not be that scientific as uh, uh, the previous uh, 
lecture, so I'm gonna take. I want to talk about uh, an interesting case that was done uh, uh, last year. So it's been like almost one year that I've done that case, and since then, I think uh, a lot of uh, improvements and. Uh, uh, in the techniques and nuances have been uh, added. So let me let it consider it as a pilot uh, case uh, where uh, some uh, mistakes are allowed, okay? So this is the case. Uh, the patient, uh, she has uh, a long face syndrome uh, with uh, a long uh, uh, lower third of her face. And this is how she smiles. We can see her gummy smile and uh, uh, the crown, uh, which are in bad condition, and also the inflammation of the gums. Uh, now, this is uh, this is uh, her profile. You can see uh, a convex profile with a retracted chin and a double here a double chin, uh, and again a long face syndrome. And this is how she smiles again. Okay, and now uh, this is her intraoral condition. Uh, you can see that she has a deep bite and uh, a lot of hopeless teeth with uh, uh, inflammation everywhere. And she was complaining of bleeding gums, bad breath and occlusion and inability to chew uh, normally uh, with, of course, uh, social concerns. Uh, this is her x-ray. We can see a lot of abscesses uh, almost on over every tooth. And she was fed up with the treatment. She has redone the root canals and uh, crowns several times with ending up with this result. And it was agreed that we uh, extract everything and uh, consider an implant uh, treatment. Uh, so, uh, uh, having this done, we uh, uh, I tried to achieve this result. Uh, these are temporaries. It's not final prosthesis. And uh, uh, this is her profile, which has uh, significant improvements, uh, like uh, the improvement in the con convexity of her face, uh, the diminishing of uh, her double chin, the, advent the advancement of her uh, chin here and uh, uh, a more, a more pleasant uh, aesthetics. So uh, I will show you in how many sessions I uh, achieved uh, this uh, treatment. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. Okay, when we talk about uh, restoring uh, using implants uh, uh, maxillary, arch. Uh, usually, if we go and dig a bit uh, the literature, we can see that the most of the concerns of the articles and the clinicians and researchers are focused more on to uh, atrophied maxillas and not excessive maxilla. And I uh, found two uh, different studies done by two different authors, which uh, actually, who actually uh, agrees on the same classification, more or less. So if we start with the class three, uh, where uh, the loss of the maxilla is uh, minimal, uh, both of the authors are uh, suggesting this such uh, design of uh, prosthesis, of cross ash prosthesis, which is similar to the prosthesis over which we are doing over uh, natural teeth. Okay, so this is the crown design, and it uh, suits uh, the class three, which has minimal uh, atrophy. When it comes to moderate atrophy. We have some uh, soft and hard tissue loss, and we have to uh, replace it or compensate this loss with uh, porcelain, uh, with pink porcelain, in order to compensate uh, this loss. And then, when we have a class one, which is uh, ex extremely mod extremely or severe uh, tissue loss, uh, this uh, uh, this kind of patients requires an overdenture because they require uh, horizontal flanges or over contour here in order to uh, reestablish her, their uh, facial and uh, lip aesthetics in order to push back or push away a bit the lips 
Uh, and in this case scenario, uh, screw retained on, or a cemented uh, bridge over influence are prohibited because this is a plaque or uh, in food retentive uh, prosthesis, they have to be uh, only retained so the patient can be able uh, is able to, to remove uh, this prosthesis in order to flush away and uh, clean uh, the integrity of the prosthesis. Otherwise, it will compromise the peri-implant health. Uh, so what about the gummy smiles? Like in my case, uh, luckily, uh, this uh, author, Bidra, he has done ex an extensive effort in the literature uh, uh, studying uh, such cases, and he has dedicated a class four uh, he has a class four uh, uh, in his classification, which is dedicated for uh, those patients who have uh, gummy smiles. And he proposes to actually convert this class four into a uh, one of these classes uh, by doing an osteotomy. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and he showed it again in the uh, in another study that he is doing this conversion from uh, from class four which is gummy smile into a class two uh, into a class two patient uh, suggesting him uh, uh, this kind of prosthesis which has a porcelain uh, a pink porcelain and i agree with him because uh, this is the class three is if we convert class four into class three it will be a very uh, challenging to to manage all the scalloping and the, uh, this festoning of the gingiva between the crowns because we don't have any teeth. And uh, if we go to the class one, I think the patient uh, uh, would not love to have a uh, something like that, like an overdenture, uh, which feels like uh, he has a denture. So the best case scenario, I think it's it will be a class two for me as well. Uh, now, how it was treated. Uh, so uh, the planning maybe took me two two weeks, I think at least. Uh, so we I followed this uh, full digital protocol, which has been uh, introduced by Francesco Mangano. He is uh, one of the founders of uh, Digital Dental Society, and he has registered his uh, this protocol scan plan make done. So what do we have to scan? We have to scan all the data of the patients. Then we have to plan uh, how to do our uh, surgery and to provide uh, uh, future teeth. And then we have to make them. It's either 3D print them or mill them. And then we have to uh, implement this uh, into the patient mouse. So four steps. Uh, we will start. Uh, we will enumerate every step. Okay. Let's proceed with the scan. Uh, so what do we have to scan? Of course, we have to scan a condom CT to have a condom CT and everyone knows that uh, such cases at least requires a condom CT. Then we have, uh, we need study models and uh, in case of digital density, these study models have to be digital. So an intraoral scan or we can uh, just uh, scan a nalginate impression or a silicone impression and then we have to also do a facial scan. And then once uh, we have these three scans, we can combine them and having, and having it in, uh, we combine all the three scans and have something called virtual patient. And it has been uh, stated a lot of times in the literature. And this is also a, a very nice article, which is a very short article uh, in order to see how uh, to stitch all or to align all these or to combine all these uh, scans. So what are the features of the facial scans? It's not only to show it to the patient that I'm a very fancy doctor, but it has uh, a lot of uh, advantages. First of all, uh, you can, after having uh, stitched everything, you can uh, uh, assess uh, the maxilla and the ins in your incisors. Uh, in relation to the uh, lip and to the midline and to the lip at maximum smile uh, and to the lip at here uh, at rest position and also you can assess any cant uh, of the jaw. Uh, also uh, a very interesting uh, advantage or if virtue is that you can you will be able to mount the 
the whole uh, case on the articulator. Uh, because you know, you can see here approximately where's the condyle, and uh, you know also the infraorbital edge. And then you align this case according to horizontal plane. Uh, you align these two points with the horizontal plane, and you will have a uh, a decent uh, articulator mounting like that. <clears throat> so this scan is done. Now, uh, what we have to plan. Uh, since uh, first of all, we will start with the maxilla. Uh, so D2D pictures, 3D pictures, and uh, the virtual uh, patient. Then uh, we will proceed with the smile design. And then after doing the smile design, we're gonna uh, we're gonna plan our implant accordingly to the smile design. So it will be a prosthetically driven planning. And uh, so let's start with the smile design. Again, this is the baseline. This is the patient. Uh, and this is uh, what is according to uh, my conception, what is the optimal maybe uh, tooth position uh, for this patient. Uh, we're going to skip all these uh, details on how to do a smile design. Uh, then. Uh, also, again, in the articulator, you can uh, uh, place uh, and verify your uh, plan, occlusal plan, which is here, was uh, uh, done to be parallel to the camper plane. And then you assess also if you have uh, planned your uh, uh, midline according to the face uh, midline. And you can assess also if the incisor address position. So all of these are the uh, advantages of having a facial scan. <clears throat> now, in order to, so this is the baseline and this is how the patient should look like. And in order to accommodate uh, this uh, set of teeth, we have to uh, cut away or cut off a segment of the maxilla in order to push uh, uh, in, the upper, in the upper direction uh, the occlusal plane and the teeth. So uh, again, if you can see here in the picture, uh, this is the baseline. Oh, sorry, uh, this is the baseline, and then this is how which, uh, we have to cut the jaw and then uh, position the uh, our uh, set of teeth. Now we have to do an implant planning after having done with the set smile uh, smile design. Uh, so uh, my implant of choice was at uh, this time. It's such an implant. I don't know if you are familiar with this micro design. Uh, I was very skeptical uh, first, uh, like maybe two years ago, to try this one. But then I was I started to be convinced, and until it, now it's becoming my uh, implant of choice for uh, full arch or cross arch prosthesis. Uh, first out of all, it is a solid abutment and doesn't have any hollow inside. And then you, we are actually by uh, using it, we are avoiding. Uh, this component, uh, which uh, and we are avoiding uh, automatically a, a micro gap on the bone level. So this implant is a solid abutment and it has a, a multi unit on top, machined multi unit on top. Okay, uh, and uh, I, I I have seen also a lot of uh, implants starting to do this micro design and to to promote it. Uh, let's uh, see all the advantages of such a uh, macro design. It is a solid implant. That means that it doesn't have any hollow inside. And since it doesn't have any hollow, hollow inside, the manufacturer can uh, manufacture it uh, way thinner, okay? Uh, because there is no hollow and uh, keeping the same mechanical properties. And since it is uh, thin, it is micro invasive, it is more uh, versatile and uh, sometimes we can avoid bone, bone augmentation and we can sometimes also uh, do a nerve bypass. From the implant abutment point of view, uh, uh, it is a tissue level implant, so we are displacing uh, currently the, the micro gap and the micro movements. It has an external connection that means that it can compensate accesses and in this case it can uh, compensate or tolerate uh, up to 60 degree of divergence. So if we have uh, two implants uh, divergent by 60 degree, uh, we can still screw retain decently a, a prosthesis over it. 
And uh, so it is truly retained. We are avoiding cementitis, and I think also it is mandatory to have cross ash prosthesis uh, to be easily retrievable because, uh, in order to maybe do maintenance or uh, to see what's going on sometimes uh, under the prosthesis. So for me, uh, the cross ash prosthesis has to be uh, removable. Uh, it has also a bulky screw in comparison with other multi unit uh, abutment. Uh, look at the diameter of the screw, and since we know that uh, such uh, such uh, connections uh, they all they only uh, retain the prosthesis by the screw and not by the friction, so uh, all all the stress will be on the screw, and that's why I think uh, this was very wise from the company to to do it larger than the other multi units. Uh, okay, so now uh, this was my implant planning. I uh, plan to place seven implants. Uh, as I said, it was like one year ago and I was new to these implants and I was not very sure if they're gonna withstand the, the loading. So I placed seven or instead of six, let's say. Uh, and uh, this was the configuration and I draw your, again, I want to draw your attention here to the uh, these two implants, uh, they were trigoid implants. And also I can, uh, I want to show you uh, that these implants are very uh, anatomy adapted because they have large threads here on their body in order to engage and compress the tuberosity, which is uh, extremely sponges. And then we have this thin part, uh, thin uh, apical part, which will engage into the trigoid plate uh, without uh, a lot of drilling. You just do a pilot drill and you don't have to, uh, to drill the trigoid uh, uh, totally. You can just do like a small drill and then uh, this implant will uh, engage it, it itself and uh, perforate the, the cortical of the uh, trigoid. Uh, so this is how uh, the future uh, schools will emerge from my uh, implant, uh, from my teeth. And then uh, this is how also the panoramic, on the panoramic x-ray, I can show you the simulation of my implant planning. And I try to avoid, in such cases, I try to avoid uh, placing the implant in the anterior region because in such cases, usually uh, I feel that I will uh, have uh, to provide an over contour or a flange in order to support the, the, the lip of the patient. Uh, so I try to avoid placing implants here in order to not to compromise uh, the peri-implant has in the future. So if uh, a flange will be needed, the prosthesis will go, the contour of prosthesis will go that way, and then uh, it will we go up here to do an over contour to the lip support and then go down again and follow the implants. Uh, and I think this is very important. <clears throat> now, uh, finished with the maxilla, we will start with the mandible. It is uh, the mandible actually was uh, planned together. The mandible and the maxilla were, were planned together before the surgery. So here we have an additional uh, component, which is the vertical dimension. Uh, we have also uh, uh, to do a smile design for the lower teeth and then to do an implant plan accordingly. But I took advantage uh, here of the uh, of the digital knowledge, if you want, and the softwares to uh, try to manage also the vertical dimension. So again, uh, if we go back to our articulator, we can see that uh, here we have aligned this patient and we have, have added the a lateral self, and you can see how accurate actually the scan, scan and the lateral self are. Uh, they are totally uh, uh, accurate. And uh, then we can uh, see also our future uh, occlusal plane and our future uh, set of teeth that I planned. And now we have uh, to uh, do something to do something to the vertical dimension. Because as we said, she has a, a long face syndrome and a very long uh, here uh, lower third part of her face. And if we do a, a basic orthodontic uh, measurement, uh, which is the 
palatal pain to mandibular pain, you're gonna get a measurement here for this case, uh, 39 degrees. And the normality is actually uh, uh, something between, uh, according to literature, something between 20 and 30. So, so we, are have, we are nine degrees uh, away from the uh, upper margin of this, uh, uh, of these values. And what I have done, I tried uh, again low uh, virtually. I tried to lower the incisal pin by three centimeter, which is actually the most uh, I could uh, uh, do in the in the software. And when, uh, of course, you can hack a bit the software and go uh, deeper, uh, more than three millimeter. But I said to myself that it, I said to myself that that these three centimeters were enough. So when I uh, lower or shorten the size of pin by three centimeters, I will get I will get oh, a, I will get a divergence uh, of 32 degrees, which is uh, only two millimeter uh, two degrees away from the upper margin from these values. And I said uh, to myself that it's okay. I, I will not go further. It will be like six to seven degrees of correction, and uh, I consider it's enough. <clears throat> so this is. Uh, the baseline. She. This. Uh, these are the two. Both of the jaws uh, at the baseline. And here, this is my uh, planned uh, set of teeth of the uh, of the upper jaw. And uh, we have. Uh, this is her actually be before lowering the uh, shortening the size of pin. This is her baseline uh, occlusion. Okay, and then uh, when we lower or I lower the incisor of pin by three centimeter, I will get something like that, an impingement of uh, my lower arch into the uh, newly planned uh, aesthetic piece, uh, upper piece. Uh, so I have to remove everything from here in order to accommodate a, a, a set of uh, lower teeth. Uh, so I have to cut away a, a certain space and uh, to fit in a... Uh, A lower denture. Okay, so this is uh, how it should look like. This is a simulation after uh, having seen the plant and osteotomy and placed uh, a lower denture. And then the implant planning again, the same implants. I placed four uh, intraforaminal implants and two short implants in the back. And this is how she should look like with the prosthesis. And uh, now I would like to show you also that you can uh, uh, send, uh, you can send actually a, a, on WhatsApp if you want or by email uh, a, a smart simulation to the patient. You can send it, uh, this is the before, and uh, this is after. Okay. So you send G, just you send uh, these two files and the, she can open the link. And uh, and then we have uh, to proceed to the make. What do we have to make? We have to make uh, first of all the bone reduction guide. Uh, look at the amount of the maxilla that we have to remove. Uh, then, after uh, having reduced uh, the jaw, we have to place a drilling guide uh, to place uh, uh, our implants in a guided manner. And then we uh, place our implants like here. And then we place something, a gasket or a spacer with indexes. You can see here two spikes and uh, a, uh, a square with, uh, with the straight angles that I designed. Uh, so this will be like locks for uh, my denture because uh, the denture uh, uh, will have uh, these offsets for these two spikes and uh, for the square with the right angles and you will be sure that it will be, be seated or positioned only in, uh, in its position. You can, uh, if something goes wrong, you have to maybe over widen a bit the abutments hole. Uh, so uh, this is for the maxilla, and then you remove and you screw in uh, the denture. This is the physical 
shapes of the guides and uh, these guides were 3D printed and uh, this uh, denture was uh, milled out of uh, PMMA and then you're going to do the same uh, for the lower. For the lower, uh, again, bond reduction guide, you do your reduction, then you place your drilling uh, guide, you place your six implants, then you will place again the same spacer with, uh, but this time uh, I conceived something that I called the a passive index, which is a ball and not a regular shape with uh, straight uh, uh, angles. And uh, this will actually uh, tolerate some uh, errors because it will act like a pivot. It will be a, a stopper, but uh, it will act, uh, it will tolerate these margin of errors because I was sure that when I'm uh, uh, reducing my uh, vertical dimension by three centimeter, I was uh, aware that there will be some uh, discrepancies that maybe the conda is not 100% uh, uh, aligned with my uh, with the patient condyle, and uh, maybe there will be some uh, asymmetries uh, uh, between the left and the, uh, the right condyle while closing the patient mouse. So uh, I conceived this uh, part and uh, it helped a lot in this unit search. Uh, and again, denture. And the idea will be that once the uh, upper uh, is in mouse uh, and you have done the surgery and uh, you have placed your abutments for pickup, you will have to place uh, this denture against the upper, uh, the lower denture against, in occlusion, against the upper denture and ask the patient during surgery uh, to close this mouse, his mouse. And once uh, the patient has closed the mouse, you will start to assemble uh, for the abutment pickup. Uh, so uh, the procedure uh, uh, was done in one surgery. Uh, the video is for me in four minutes, but uh, I can assure you that uh, the surgery took a bit longer. Are we supposed to see a video? Yeah, yeah, now it's working. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, this is uh, the video. I now. So this was a single session makeover. You can see the result. Um, this was like maybe the, the pictures were taken one week maybe later. These are, as I said, temporaries. And uh, uh, this is how patient uh, looks uh, right now. No, it's not right now. Uh, look when she has uh, she had uh, her temporaries. Now uh, I don't know if if we have. Uh, time or it's it's up to you either i stop my presentation here or we can discuss and do self-critics or we can i can show you how i convert this uh, case uh, into only two sessions into a final prosthesis so it's up to you i don't know if we have time mm, yes uh, we have a yeah we have a little bit time uh, can you make uh, this uh, final prosthesis uh, let me say yeah. in five five six okay. seven minutes Yes, and then we go course. in the discussion because I think a lot of people have questions to this yeah. approach. I will skip this. Okay, so uh, after six months, uh, like after the Corona lockdown, let's say maybe three months ago, uh, we have started uh, the prosthetic part. And in the first session, uh, you can see uh, these uh, spaces and voids which were expected actually after um, the osteotomy you can see that uh, she is not very diligent with the uh, with the uh, oral hygiene uh, i stress on the fact that she has to uh, clean it with water floss every day at least uh, two times but uh, she is neglecting it uh, so uh, i consider actually is uh, the denture as uh, a, a an impression, and I relined uh, this uh, denture with a soft relining uh, material like this one. In this case, the MG, and uh, uh, so this in, in this way I took the impression of the soft tissue, and then uh, uh, these are the denture which were stood out from the patient mouse and then I stood in the analogs and uh, also in the same uh, session while the patient is uh, in the office you mix some plaster and you insert uh, the intaglio with the analogs, uh, analogs in place into uh, the plaster and once it's set you will have something like that and then uh, you will remove the dentures and you will have uh, the the jaws of the patient or the master models and you can uh, place uh, your scan post in order to scan it uh, you can also place the upper and the lower in occlusion like that uh, and then uh, you will have uh, these two case scenario the the models uh, with the uh, with the analogs and the models with the dentures the same you, you you so you have to scan them twice first of all you you put on the dentures and you uh, consider them like a wax up scan and you scan the upper and lower denture as a wax up scan and then you remove it and you uh, scan uh, your uh, with an intraoral scan in the clinic, uh, your uh, about uh, your scan post, and uh, before uh, doing uh, this, you you uh, place these two models in occlusion and you scan the occlusion and you'll get something like that. And then, uh, after having uh, obtained all these uh, scans, uh, I don't know about other uh, scanners, but this scanner will uh, deduct or, or will deduce. Uh, uh, the intramaxillary position from here. So now you have an accurate uh, uh, intramaxillary relation. He, I went to, to Exocad and I designed a, uh, a Toronto bridge, or it's more known in Exocad like Thimble Crown Bridge. It has a lot of advantages uh, for those who don't know. Uh, I can show you the first advantage. Uh, this was done by, uh, the study was done by Ligia in 2008. He was not that famous by that time, but uh, the study is very interesting. 
he, he assessed the following. Uh, he noticed that within a period of three uh, years and a half, uh, when uh, in, uh, the implant supported only a single crown, the fracture, uh, the risk of fracture of the porcelain fracture was 1.3. When it was about bridges over implant, uh, the risk of fracture of porcelain chipping was around seven. And when it was uh, about cross arch prosthesis, uh, PFM cross arch prosthesis over implants, uh, the personal fracture uh, risk was uh, like 40%, which is a big amount. And I think I have uh, the same findings, I think, in my experience. So this is why I try, uh, by doing that, uh, I'm minimizing my, uh, my personal chipping. Uh, I, and I consider that I'm actually uh, converting this full arch pro uh, ceramic uh, prosthesis from full, full arch into single crowns by doing that. And that way, I'm considering that I'm lowering my uh, risk of fracture into 1.3% of the crowns. Another other advantages also are ease of re retrievability of uh, different components. So that means, but if in case you have uh, one fracture, you will uh, remove only this, uh, the concerned teeth and uh, repair it or uh, redo it again. And you don't have to uh, unscrew the whole prosthesis. Also, you have the advantage of uh, hiding your screws uh, in case you have in an anterior region, let's say a, a screw which is emerging from here, from buckle side, you will be able to just hide it under the crown. And uh, you have also, this is also a very interesting fact that you will have an improved method framework fit uh, because uh, you, when uh, the dental technician is firing uh, these uh, crowns, it doesn't bring uh, this big framework into the, uh, the furnace again. So he is avoiding uh, repeated firing and he is avoiding uh, distortions. Uh, so these are mainly the main advantages of uh, such a prosthesis. And before uh, I uh, manufactured uh, the final prosthesis, I was very, uh, I was very, uh, very concerned about uh, my scanning and my uh, scanning software and uh, the printing if uh, they will uh, fit. So I designed uh, two bars in over, before manufacturing the, prothe the prosthesis in order to check the fit. And I was amazed how passive it was. Uh, honestly, it was the first time that uh, a framework can be that fit, uh, that passively fit in my, in my experience. Uh, so having that done, I uh, uh, proceeded with the manufacturing uh, of the prosthesis and you can go either full digital, that means that you 3D print or mill uh, the substructure and the full co uh, contour uh, crowns from zirconia, let's say, and you deliver it in one uh, stage. Uh, so you mill everything or you 3D print and you deliver it. Uh, I didn't, in my case, and I didn't do, do this approach because I was limited with my dental technician because uh, uh, my dental technician, he, he, which is a, who is an average guy, he is he's not into digital dentistry. And since he, he was the one who referred the patient uh, for me, I was obliged to, to work at least uh, a small part with him. So I uh, conferred the layering uh, of the prosthesis uh, to him. So we 3D printed uh, from my design here, we 3D printed the, uh, the substructures. And then uh, since it will be a manual layering technique, we have to mount it on an articulator. And also uh, when uh, doing uh, the uh, impressions, uh, as I told you, when, doing it, when placing the denture and placing the analogs and so on, I also, uh, at the stage of planning, I did this. Uh, it was retrieved, uh, the, the occlusal plane was retrieved from my planning and I uh, did this step, the table, uh, the occlusal table. Then I placed uh, uh, the upper maxilla and then we mounted the articulator and they, I even 3D printed for him uh, some crowns so he can uh, follow the profile of the crowns and also to double check the occlusion. And uh, this is the ceramics, and this is the work done. And then we have uh, the delivery of uh, the substructures. And uh, um, uh, as I uh, as I told you here, 
uh, I was obliged to do a facial, uh, a, a contouring, an over contouring of the upper uh, uh, jaw in the anterior zone in order to uh, uh, push away a bit the uh, the upper lip. And here, uh, around the implants, uh, all the surface has to be flat or uh, convex. So this is the final result. And uh, this is was baseline, and this is now how she is. Uh, so baseline after the first session and at the fourth session. To be honest with you, uh, it took me a, a fifth session because uh, I did some uh, adjustments here in the anterior region. Uh, so basically, uh, if we do it in a full digital protocol, I think you will. Uh, we can be able to do it in four sessions. And I don't know why I, I have even more improved uh, here, the double chin uh, between here and here. Uh, however, the occlusion was uh, the same in the vertical dimension. And you can see here that uh, here without the over contour, we had like a retracted lip a little bit. And here we have a more decent and more pleasant aesthetic of the upper lip because of this uh, uh, over contour or the flange of the prosthesis. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. I have uh, uh, a part about uh, to, to self critics, if you want, and uh, to show you how uh, things had improved. Uh, but I think we don't have time. And let's uh, get some questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for this case, uh, which is really, um, yeah challenging i would say um and uh, yeah it's also showing uh, to the end uh, with the prosto and also the problem that still now we have to we near uh, this uh, structures by hand to have a good aesthetic ceramic veneering and then you have to go back to analog and not to full digital so a lot of questions because of this long journey of this case even if it's done only in four sessions and uh, thank you also that you'll be so honest and uh, tell the truth that you have take five appointments because of some correction in aesthetics, uh, Daniel. But uh, this is our education in the MOI that we talk about the truth, uh, what happens in the cases and what is working and what not working. And I'm very proud that all my students uh, follow this recommendation. So um, any questions, uh, Catherine, in the... Yeah. Yes, actually, we got a question from uh, YouTube. Oh, from good. One of the participants streaming on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, it's Sven Nalder, and he is asking, what software are you using for complex surgical planning, and how happy are you with it? Uh, uh, in every case, I try to manipulate or to learn new uh, softwares, but uh, in this case, I used... Uh, uh, for the facial scan, it was uh, the Bellus uh, 3D. For the jaw scans, it was the Medit. Uh, for the planning uh, of the surgery, it was uh, Blue Sky Plan uh, with a, um, a lot of mesh mixer and uh, uh, Exocard. Hmm. Okay. It. Thank you, Daniel. Our uh, next question comes from Dr. Jawad. You got yeah. the microphone? Yes, yes. Uh, very exciting. And you have a brave heart, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, I, I really, I wanted to ask about the reduction. For me, it seems so huge, the big reduction in lower arch. Do you think it's, it was so necessary to do like uh, this? Yes, so let, let me go back to the, um, to the planning. Uh, uh, can you see my screen or no? No, you, you have to share again. Uh, yes. Okay. So if we, uh, because is uh, uh, she has a uh, class uh, skeletal class two uh, retrognathus in the mandible, so. If I don't cut enough bone, I will have like a step here. You understand what I mean? I will do uh, my, uh, I will plan my my impl my denture here, and do, then I will have a step like that to go and follow the profile of the mandible. 
So that's why I uh, I removed uh, more bone in order to uh, to give this uh, smooth transition between uh, uh, the denture and the profile of the mandible. Otherwise, it will uh, it will be like a step. I don't know if you 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 got my point. Okay. Next okay. question. Jawad, um, you happy? Yes. Yes. Uh, I I another question. Do you have in this this system uh, root? Uh, System. Do you have uh, ang angulated uh, multi units? No, this this type of implants it has only it comes like that. It has only a straight multi unit, but it can con uh, it can uh, tolerate or correct the axis up to sixty degrees. So if you have two implants, or you have like you are doing four, uh, a node on four with two implants, uh, straight implants, and two implants. Uh, Divergent implants who are uh, like up to 60 degree divergent, you will still be able to, to place a screw in and then an a prosthesis. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, the next, we have more questions actually. Next question is from Dr. Jonas. Hi, uh, hi, Daniel. Uh, hi, hi, Jonas. Hi, it's a really very nice work, or very nice outflow and uh, amazing results. Uh, actually, I don't have a question. I have a uh, criticism and my opinion. Can I say it? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have seen a lot of cases uh, like that, and uh, a lot of cases they were referred to me. Uh, and I, ha I have to tell you, it's uh, it, these patients are really happy with the outcome for the uh, coming few years only. And mm. uh, with, this, with this type of uh, prosthesis and uh, this type of uh, uh, implant systems, mm -hmm. I noticed that they have a lot of uh, bone loss later in two years and uh, three years follow up. A lot of uh, okay. uh, pre-implantitis infections, which you cannot treat yeah. and uh, mobility explantations because of okay. the the uh, food accumulation which they cannot they cannot clean it's it's uh, i'm sorry to tell you it's 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 horrible yeah but usually uh, 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 this is and uh, I'm, I'm not inventing anything new you have like a cross arch uh, a screw retained prosthesis over multi units uh, i don't know why it's not plausible i have a lot of patients like that and uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, Literature is talking about these cross arch processes which are so retained over multi unit. I didn't invent anything here, and I think that these uh, profiles and the intaglios are uh, really cleansable. And here, I, I, I believe I even uh, uh, trimmed a bit before placing uh, the prosthesis uh, to render it more uh, cleansable. And uh, so, I, know I, I have a lot of uh, uh, designs. Uh, these, uh, especially these designs, I, I do screw retain uh, cross arch process a lot, and uh, I don't know. I think I think I think because of the reduction, you reduce the ah, uh, okay uh, the 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 actually the cortical bone. Okay. You have only spongiosa, and then the bone is uh, more sensitive, and then you have yeah. more bone reduction. Might, might be, might be, might be. Because I ha I have seen a lot of really a lot of cases which I couldn't treat. Uh, we had to remove all the implants, and because of the implant system, I guess if if you would use to uh, normal implants, which would be better for the future. I don't know for how long you are using this system. Yeah. but you will see this like, problems after three to five years yeah okay so i will i will make a new presentation about how i manage this case yeah <laughs> it would be interesting <laughs> yeah good uh, it's very nice that you discuss again and uh, this controversially uh i have a question to you uh you have these cases especially to this root implant or uh, do you see only some uh implants which are not so famous uh but uh Daniel introduced this uh, kind of concept of called root implant. I think it's coming from Switzerland. And do we have these cases on this implant or do you see it more or less on all implants because you have, uh, with a bone reduction, removed the cortical plates? Uh, I, I have seen it with root as well. Also, okay. uh, you have to dig where this implant's coming from. I cannot tell you. 
Okay, okay, good. Yeah, but good. I mean, because uh, there is also, sorry uh, to interrupt you, there is also the Blue Sky Bio is doing the same design, like a thin implant with a multi unit on the top. And uh, there is also an Italian brand, uh, which is called uh, Oxy Implant. They have also uh, the same micro design, like uh, a solid uh, implant with uh, multi unit abutment. So yeah, I, I don't know uh, about them, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I work, uh, I work in Israel. In Israel, yeah. they use a lot, a lot, this system. Okay. Uh, and this route and I have to tell you a lot of implants which they are uh, you see on them made in Switzerland or made in Germany yeah. and they are yeah. uh, produced somewhere else no uh, I, not, uh, I know I know that yeah okay. yeah of course. okay good uh, yeah this is very interesting uh, we have to discuss later on um, but uh, I have also a question mm, if you have this uh, final occlusion uh, we have now looking because you use Exocad as a software yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, so three weeks ago, we have a device from France called Mocho uh, is yes, registering exactly. uh, the lower jaw movements very easily, very fast. And uh, you get a, a great uh, improvement to have these uh, full arch restorations in a vertical articulator. So my question is, you use a, a vertical articulator for um, yeah, assessing the planes and the occlusal plane and so on. But do you also make uh, some dynamic occlusion or something more than with this articulator or is only static? Uh, uh, no, it was only static, but there is a way that I found out after the, uh, after doing this case that uh, you can, uh, uh, calculate somehow the Bennett angle and uh, uh, the condylian slope uh, by uh, calculating the movements of her uh, uh, previous dentition. I, I, I would like to show you uh, or to send you a link about that. But yes, I'm aware about this uh, module. Uh, it costs 25,000 euros. Uh, you have also a cheaper alternative, which is Russian. Uh, it's called ProSystem. Uh, and it, uh, it does the same work. Uh, I, I don't have any experience with it, but uh, I think, yes, this is a good addition, especially for uh, such cases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, more questions, uh, Catherine, from the chat and from YouTube. Okay. Yes. Um, the next question is from David O'Dowling. David? Hi, uh, Daniel. Um, very interesting case. I was just wondering, um, did you have any occlusal shots of the maxillary prosthesis? Because I always struggle in changing the vertical dimension, but also the, I'm going to say the skeletal relationship in cases like that with the, the position of the anterior maxillary implants. You know, I find it a bit of um, uh, reducing the, the tongue space for the, for the patient. And I was just wondering how you, you, you felt that, you know? Yeah, concerning the the, the tongue space, uh, I presented a lot of this case in several congresses, and I had a lot of remarks concerning regarding this tongue space. But uh, I can assure you that uh, she never reported reported me such mm -hmm. a problem, and hey. I, I don't even dare to ask her because <laughs> they will start <laughs> saying, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." You had another question also. No, um, no, that was me. Oh, sorry. Ah, David, you have another question. No, please go no, on. No, no. No, that's, yeah, that's fine. Anyway, that but, yeah, we, we have to hurry up because time is running. And so we have a lot of questions. So also the okay. other one. Uh, next have, question in the answer. chat is from Michael Basidi. Michael? Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, just uh, a couple of questions or quick questions. Uh, first Only one, one. Regarding Only the, one. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to compress them. <laughs> it's the tuberosity implants. Do you have to reflect the flap behind the tuberosity just to make sure you're not invading into the infratemporal fossa or the tracheomaxillary oh, fissure. Uh, uh, okay. That's one yeah, thing. The other thing, uh, did the patient ever consider orthognathic surgery instead of that amount of bone removal? Like it's almost like a lift fort one. Yeah. Uh, you can adjust it and then start implants in an easier yeah. way. That, that would be my rationale from orthodontic yeah. perspective as well. Okay. I, I think that uh, 
uh, we start with this last question. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that with the state of uh, her dentition, I don't think that uh, it was an option to, to tell her, you know, go. Uh, Not go also like orthognathic surgery, just to yeah, adjust yeah, the, yeah, but, the skeletal uh, relation you, yes, and then you can you do have, implants. Yeah, but you have to, to do a pretreatment uh, before, an orthodontic pretreatment before to adjust everything. And then I think, the, uh, my, I don't know, my, my wife is an orthodontist and she, she said that. <laughs> <laughs> that you have and, to do an orthodontic And usually treatment. with the mandible, because with these cases with VMA or vertical maxillary excess, if you intrude the molars, which you did through your uh, osteotomy and your implants, yeah. there will happen mandibular translation that will move the mandible forward. You can guard yeah, it even exactly. with the prosthesis. So you don't have to remove a lot of bone from the mandible like uh, Eunice was talking about before. That, that, that was my only concern from an yeah. orthodontic perspective. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's all. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm. Yeah, but um, I have to add, uh, okay, I have not, with all things, I'm very happy with this case because we can discuss now hours for that because it was a very challenging. But Daniel, uh, I think you want to show how fast it works if you go this approach. And the other approach with the orthognathic surgery and so on is, of course, taking a little bit longer time and you have more appointments and so on. But um, I agree with Mik Mikhail Basili, right? Um, that uh, we have to discuss also these other treatment options uh, uh, seriously. But um, of course, uh, once you have to find a decision and we know we have a lot of alternative therapies. And yeah. so as long as uh, it works, um, we say nothing is wrong or right. Uh, it's another option, right? Okay, so next question. Uh, I, just uh, I just wanted to add that I have uh, almost exactly the same case that I have done like uh, three years ago, but in an analog way, okay? And it took me maybe more than uh, 30 uh, sessions and uh, during maybe one, uh, one year and a half. So I, was, I just was uh, telling you and showing you how fast is the digital density and how uh, things can, are evolving. Okay, so Catherine? Okay, yeah, then the last question is from Dr. Zuman Reddy. You have to, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hey, David, uh, that was an amazing case. I did a similar case in February, but with the regular implants. I just had a question whether this is the same as the single piece implant, what we call it back home here in India. Uh, I, I know about uh, these implants they are talking about. You, uh, the other implants that you are talking about are... Uh, uh, yeah, one piece implant that have an abutment on their top, right? No, this is not the same. This is the same, I think, the same uh, company that is manufacturing, but this is a, uh, another thing. It, this implant has a multi-unit on the top, not an abutment. Correct. We, we are getting certain single piece implants with multi-units. As you said, yeah. they are fixed and you can manipulate the axis uh, however know. you no, so, if you, no, you. If you are asking if it's bendable, no, it's not. If this implant is bendable, that it's not. Okay, it was an excellent case. Thank you so much you. for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a last question. Uh, we invited a, a lecturer recently, and um, he is also working on a software where you can calculate the change in the face after you change the vertical dimension or you make some orthognathic. Uh, uh, surgery, it's out uh, from, um, and, and uh, do you use also this kind of uh, software because you work with three dimensional faces and so on and you show, okay, this is the profile uh, before and after the treatment and even after the final one, it's changing again. Yeah. Um, but this is our photo which you make after you inserted the temporary or the final restoration. But do you know also because you're really deep in this kind of digital workflow that we can use perhaps in future also the uh, pre-calculation of the changes in the face and the profile uh, ahead of surgery and ahead of bone reduction, because this will be very helpful to uh, rule out some really bad uh, yeah, outcomes. Mm. Uh, I have uh, heard, only heard about these uh, softwares. Uh, one of the softwares is called, uh, I'm not sure about it, is Dolphin. Uh, all the orthodontists are using it. And uh, I have heard that uh, like uh, 
a long time ago they were being able to uh, uh, simulate the, the the skin and the facial mm -hmm. aesthetics after orthodontic surgery i never seen this uh, uh, software but uh, i've heard that it can do such things and we all have also now uh, uh, in the US, I don't, I don't remember anymore uh, the name. They are um, these facial scans that I show are static, but uh, in the near yeah, because, future they will be yeah. dynamic. Yeah, because this this uh, this approach is coming for the orthodontist and for the orthokinetic surgery, right? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so this is uh, this uh, this field, but we come from the implantology, and uh, if you make a bone reduction in this amount, like your case you are more or less similar with uh, orthognetic surgery yeah. uh, in, 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 in the dimension, right? So if you make a LIF4 uh, surgery, uh, what we already hear, uh, you have in the final also this kind of reduction. And so I think for the future, it will be nice to integrate not only the chewing of the, uh, of, of with Mocho others, uh, also yeah. to uh, integrate software which give you some more uh, mm, yeah, predictability of the changes in the whole face with this kind of bone reduction. And because nice. uh, it's what you say, with the virtual patient, we get more and more added software, which we can uh, do a lot of calculation ahead of we doing it. And um, yeah, appreciate if you go on this way as a MOI alumni and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and push it forward. Even uh, we have always uh, in the end a discussion if this is really the right way to make this kind of case, yeah? and especially for the hygiene you see after you get it back six months later, the, the, this woman has no idea of hygiene, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. So, uh, Catherine, uh, I think uh, it was my comment was the last one. Yes, uh, there's no more questions. The goodbye message will be yours, Paul. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, everything has a start and the an end. And unfortunately, we are now in the end of this uh, kind of uh, online Congress. And we have to thank you uh, that you all stay here. And uh, we have it recorded. You can also see it in YouTube. And um, I have to thank first my staffs. Yeah, you see. Everything is working very stable uh, with uh, all uh, these preparations ahead. And I'm very proud to have this behind me. This is the team approach, you know, it's exactly the same. Like if you do it in your office with all of these uh, uh, neurosurgeons and dental technicians and whatever. Uh, on the other hand, I have to say thank you to every lecturer. Uh, taking a lot of time and effort to prepare this lecture and to do this lecture. Some of these lecturers you hear have 400 already or 500. Some of the lecturers have only one or two, but all of these lectures were very, very nice and are on a very high level in the presentation and also in uh, the content. So I'm very proud on this kind of Congress again. Uh, therefore, we are absolutely sure that we have, uh, again, uh, this kind of MOI annual congress and hope God that we have it now again in Frankfurt personally, because all the social things are a little bit missing, coffee drinking, beer drinking, party and so on. Uh, but I think in next year we will have it again. It was September 9 to 11, so it's a very nice uh, uh, wording uh, 9 11 2021. Um, and so it's a three day event, and we do everything to uh, have again this kind in Villa Kennedy of uh, um, yeah, of this uh, event of this MOI, um, yeah, annual congress with the graduation ceremony in the next day. Um, you can contact us again over the website or directly over the email if you have any questions also to these lectures. We will forward it to the lecturers and we'll support you. And, uh, and uh, of course, we are needing you uh, that you recommend us and our program to survive, yeah, uh, because it's now a very hard time. And if uh, students come again, we will be very happy. 
And uh, so till now we are very, very nice uh, working together with you. And I will say goodbye and keep healthy. And we will very happy if you talk about this Congress and about the quality of this Congress to your friends and to the implant community and the, the dental community so that we have again more and more interested to join our program and that the family is growing and growing and growing. Yeah, this is my personal wish. And thank you, keep healthy and have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Thank you, Sean. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>